Um, so uh, it's nine o'clock, we'll get started as we wait for some more folks to come in. Um, but uh, I guess we'll kick it off to Lindsay to officially kick us off. Hanford Advisory Board, River and Plateau Committee meeting. My name is Lindsay Summers. I am the deputy. To identify a few reminders before we get started. The first one is this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And the second one is each member has a joint responsibility for assuring that the operating ground rules are observed and discussions are conducted in a respectful manner. I appreciate your attendance today and I look forward to a robust meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom. We have a action packed agenda today. Um, so hopefully those, uh, oh, we have more people coming, which is good. Three briefings from the TPA agencies, which uh, is really great to see that level of engagement and uh, we'll, we'll get learned, it's great. Um, we also have a piece of potential advice that came out of the issue manager team that we're gonna be talking about um, for, oh, brief time. Uh, I think we only have 45 minutes for that, so we'll have to be uh, efficient. Um, and then uh, it's also work plan season, so we're going to talk about what we think the uh, CARM uh, cleanup and risk mitigation committee should have on their work plan for the next fiscal year. So um, a lot to do. Um, so uh, two things that came in the packet that we're not going to talk a lot about, but uh, the uh, meeting minutes from the last minute meeting. Uh, did anyone have any suggestions? I didn't see anything wrong with them, but I want to make sure if, if there's something I missed, uh, somebody says something. So anything? OK, so let's go ahead and uh, get those approved for the record. And then um, the wrap sheet for this, this meeting uh, was extra long. We had some rec requests to add some of the project manager meeting links into that. So, um, and I also added some some tank waste community stuff in there too. So, um, it's a little long. But uh, if you have any questions about the documents on there, want to talk about it during open forum, which is um, sort of our chance to talk amongst ourselves in a in a um, informal, unstructured way, and we can sort of ramble a bit. Um, and uh, see where the conversation leads us uh, during that part of the day, which is after after well, almost at the end of the day. So we'll have that time after we're all in the meeting coma after we've been here for so long. Uh, am I missing anything? Introduction and administrative review. There's a couple of housekeeping things. Okay, um, Ruth, I guess there's a couple of housekeeping things <laughs> that we should talk about. Right, so the first thing is to let you know that we record all committee meetings um, and those recordings are posted on the Hanford website. So um, it's important that you know that we're recording. Um, if you are with us in the room, we would love to collect your autograph on the sign-in sheet next to the cookies. Um, if you're online, if you please sign in and chat so we can um, keep our records under the Federal Advisory Committee Act of who is here. And you want to join into the conversation, just let us know in chat and we'll put you in the queue and make sure that you have a chance to ask your question or um, express your opinion. Um, We've got these funny looking owls in the room. Um, talk to the owl, because that's what's gonna pick you up so the people online can hear. We've got um, 11 folks online. Building a side conversation, the owl listens for where the noise is and it will pick you up. <laughs> so if you, if you have a side conversation, don't be near the owl. Um, Ryan, do you have some housekeeping stuff you've got to do in terms of exits and badging and stuff like that? Too much. Just make sure you guys hand up uh, when you leave for the day and keep your badges back to the desk. You can see you probably have numbers like in the hundreds now. That's because people just take them with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, also, I've uh, got an exit right there and an exit up front where you guys came in. And you got, if, you have, if you have to use the restroom, you go down to the end of the hall before the double doors, the restrooms are right there. And then there's a water fountain right outside the doors too. And I think that's everything I had. 
I have a question. Do yeah. you um, keep track of the people that are online as attending the meeting? Do you capture the names? Right. Watch so, yes. so at the back of, of your meeting minutes, the people who are attending in purpose in person are asterisk. So you can tell kind of who was online and who was in the room. So we've been doing that for about a year. Okay, thank you. Because we weren't sure how it was going to play out. Um, so speaking of uh, who's online and who's in the room, uh, why don't we take, uh, we've got 10 minutes left on the agenda for the opening. So why don't we go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves? So. I mean, I think I know everybody here, but there's people online that might not. So uh, let's uh, let's start with Ryan and uh, work around. <laughs> Ryan Miller, Ecology. Susan Coleman, Public at Large. Jan Cottrell, League of Women Voters. Ben Vanna, DOE. Len Wigglefuss, DOE. I'm Josh. Alicia, I'm in the corner. Alicia Boyd, I'm with Ecology. I'm Josh Patton, I work with the Facilitation Team. Ruth Nicholson, facilitation team. I'm Tom Josiah, Oregon Department of Energy, and the chair. Pam Larson, Benton County. Jay Anderson, uh, Grant, and Franklin County. Mary Ann Wanagy, HMIF. Lindsay Summers, DOE. And Jason Capron, DOE. I think that was the fastest introduction <laughs> we've ever done at a heavy meeting. Well, you only got half. Great, so let's let's go online now. Uh, if you're, if you're um, online, and uh, we're going to go alphabetically down the list. I usually just go down the list because they, they can't see each other. Right. So so uh, so Ruth will call it the name uh, and uh, introduce yourself, say why you're here, or you can choose not to speak. Um, but we'll just have an awkward silence. <laughs> Stephanie Brasher. Good morning. I'm with HMIS Triparty Agreement. Edward Dawson. Uh, DOE communications, uh, just listening in. Thanks. Dana. Hello, DOE communications. I'm here in the event that any PI questions arise. Thank you. Laura Harmon. Right. <laughs> Lee Wong. Yeah, combination WM. I'm just listening. Matthew Campbell. Matthew Campbell, Federated Tribe C Matilla, Energy and Environmental Sciences Program. Tom. Rogers. Tom, you're showing is unmuted. Oh, muted again. Well, darn. Tom is with the Washington Department of Health. Um, Simone. Good morning, Simone Anter, uh, Columbia Riverkeeper. Anders. Uh, good morning. Uh, I go by Andy. Andy Weborg, uh, DOE's Richland Operations. I'm here on behalf of Mark French. And Matt Williams. Uh, Ecology. I'll be helping uh, answer any questions if needed for the waste encapsulation and storage facility later and uh, just listening in for the moment. All right. Well, welcome. We're glad you're listening in um, wherever you happen to be coming from. Tom? Okay. Um, one more, I guess, one more announcement to make. Uh, we started some, uh, the Executive Issues Committee uh, started some new uh, sort of task force or teams uh, at the last meeting. Um, one of them is for HAD member orientation, um, which uh, Mia is uh, leading. And uh, the other is a document that um, is not going to replace the process manual, but will sort of um, tell us how we as HAB members have 
I'm making kind of a verb here. Um, so if you're interested in process and um, sort of best practices, um, I'm, I'm heading up that committee. Uh, we haven't come up with a name yet. Um, we've been calling the document Fred because we haven't come up with a name yet. So if you want to join the Fred team. Um, I don't know what I did. <laughs> We have the soundtrack. Um, so, yeah, if you want to join the Fred team, uh, send me and the facilitation team an email, and uh, we can uh, make sure people know what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, it's a little bit early. Are, do we want to jump into uh, hundred k cleanup, or do we want to? You want to jump in? Okay. Go to the slides, or I guess everybody has. Um, so Ryan, just so folks know how the tech works in the room, um, we've loaded all the documents on Ryan's computer, and I've got backups here. So Ryan is our 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 AV guy. This is the 100K remediation one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, let me just share the screen real quick so folks online. And that's, that's the PDF of the slide deck. Oh. Okay. Well, if you need a hard copy, there's some here. Um, if you want to take some notes, so I'll just start off. So uh, my name is Manuel Lopez. I work uh, for the as a project engineer for the Richardson Operations Office. Uh, and work with uh, Project and Facility Division doing oversight of 100K area remediation. Um, so if we go to our first slide, uh, made a slide on our briefing purpose. So I was asked to provide an update on 100K remediation and I chose to focus mostly on uh, 105K West Base and deactivation, uh, 105K East in terms of storage, and uh, soil remediation and facility demolition of the 100K. So if we go to our next slide, I can do that. <laughs> so I just want to give folks a, a perspective of what has been done in the past, at least a high level view. So from 1966, we can see our first picture during uh, the K area uh, operations. You can see there's two reactors in the area. So the reactors were first developed for the Cold War expansion effort. Um, basically, the Cold War was gearing up and we needed some more plutonium, so that was our main purpose for making the K area site. Um, so they operated from 1955 to 1971 um, before they were deactivated and then the basins were repurposed. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more of where the basin is in relation to the reactor. Um, uh, were repurposed for storage of uh, in reactor fuel uh, before being processed into the Purex facility. So eventually in 1990, uh, at the tail end of the Cold War, the Pure X facility was shut down. So the two basins were left with 2,100 metric tons of uh, fuel, spent fuel. Yeah. And an effort was made to remove that fuel and sent over to the canister storage building. So in 2000, 2004, canister storage building. Um, and then in 2007, uh, since uh, the, the fuel had 10 years of life in the basin, or it's degrading down and having some small particulates of uh, what we defined as sludge between uh, EPA and DOE. So anything below a quarter of an inch is considered sludge. All, the, all those bigger sections of fuel were transported to CSB. And eventually in 2010, we uh, consolidated all that sludge from the K East Basin and transferred it over to the K West Basin into engineer containers. And I'll show some pictures of the engineer containers in the later slide. Um, so we filled up three of those in the basin at K West. Later on, we uh, cleaned up the floor at K uh, West also. So consolidated all that sludge from the K West Basin. Uh, put it into the three additional engineer containers um, and by 2019 you can see uh, the picture of our progress being made. Uh, so 2010 was mostly to showcase uh, at the point of, in time where we started doing the demolition of the reactor at K-East. Uh, we completed the, the demolition of the clear well at K-West and the cooling pond both uh, on K-East K-West were removed in 2010. 
2019 when you completed the sludge transfers of that uh, material. Um, you can see uh, with the soil remediation and facility demolitions. <coughs> Um, so by 2023 or 2022, we completed the ISS of the KE structure, um, and we completed the, the ISS of that structure, and you can see some of the progress, significant progress being made on soil remediation at that point in time. We'll talk about that a little bit more in later slides. Uh, so if we go to our next slide. Oh. So in the reactor building, I wanted to give folks a, a perspective of where the basin is in, re in relation to the reactor core. So you can see where the reactor core is for the Hay West area. The basin is right behind it where the fuel is sunk and put in the basin. Um, uh, trying to give folks a, a relationship to how big the basin is. So in terms of Olympic sized swimming pools, this is twice the size of an Olympic sized swimming pool in terms of volume. Uh, it's a little bit smaller in, in terms of uh, the length and width. Uh, so we have 1.5 million gallons of water in the basin, and you can see some of the dewatering equipment that's on the left side there, uh, where we're looking to uh, filter out the basin water and transport. Area. Um, so just to give a little uh, more clarity in, on other sites, there's uh, some office buildings right to the left of the reactor core, or the right of the reactor core. They have some um, uh, lunchroom areas. Uh, they have the rack pond um, and the shift station on there. So our main goal this year is to move folks out of the reactor building and put them into those trailers on the left side. You can see two big trailers there and have basically people using those trailers to, to rack out of the basin. So once they're done with their work, they can go and survey out through those trailers. There'll be a covered corridor leading into the trailers. Um, so basically, the ultimate goal is to have the reactor core, uh, the only remaining structure in that uh, K-West area. Uh, that's our end goal to ISS or insurance storage. Um, so going on to the next slide, um, basin demolition sequence. I kind of just wanted to give folks a perspective of where we're at, at the, in our current uh, timeline. So our first row basin deactivation, where we're basically doing staging of equipment, documenting and dosing, uh, coordinating workers, as I mentioned, uh, out of the uh, K-West reactor building, um, and basically removing all the asbestos that we can uh, get to at this point in time. So basin deactivation would also encompass dewatering and grouting. To get water would involve removing 1.5 million gallons of water, and once that's all completed, we would do some fixative addition. So uh, place some a fixative on the walls and then move into grouting. So grouting would involve adding 14, roughly 14 inches of grout to the bottom to solidify all the equipment at the bottom of the basin. And then we would put control density fill, which is concrete, but a lot softer concrete, mostly more compacted dirt. So once we fill the basin up with 20 feet of concrete in the basin, um, we would be done with the activation once everything is cold and dark in the facility and moving on to our next row would be the demolition phase of work um, uh, starting with above grade demolition so anything above the basin um, floor uh, would be demolished so as I mentioned those um, office uh, structures that around the, the core would need to be demolished and superstructure above the, the basin would also be demolished uh, then we would remove the stage hydrous debris, and I'll talk about those in a later slide, uh, what we mean by stage hydrous debris, <clears throat> and then do demolition of the below grade structure, which would include the basin. And what remediation below the basin uh, and surrounding areas of the reactor and move into internal state storage. So basically completing what we have in KEs and transferring over to long-term stewardship as our final step for their five-year periodic uh, inspections. So to the next slide, I wanted to give some, or show some pictures of the K-West deactivation activities. So I'll mostly firstly be talking about the green hued uh, pictures that are all underwater in the basin. Um, just wanted to show the type of uh, equipment and, and uh, 
material under the basin. So the, the, the first picture there in green, you can see the, the hoses and wires that are being cut. So that's what we're actively working on now. Uh, size reducing that uh, those materials and placing them into appropriate locations in the basin. So then we would, uh, on our below picture there on the left, um, we have some of the coal tool ends. So uh, everything that's being done in the basin requires uh, to be, uh, at least work has to be done underwater and folks can't reach that. So we need uh, long reach pole tools that are uh, 20 plus feet long. Uh, and during past efforts with uh, removing the fuel uh, and uh, transferring and just maintenance of the, of the basin uh, required uh, a lot of long reach pole tools. So they had around 415 uh, long reach pole tools that were uh, set aside on a certain part of the basin. Uh, kind of called it the graveyard since it was all unused long reach pole tools. So you can see the end being cut up. And then on that last picture, you can see the engineer containers. Uh, one empty and the one on top is uh, full of uh, uh, equipment that would be grouted. So the long reach pole tools are all set on the bottom of the floor. Um, basically, will be encased in grout once we start doing the grouting of the basin. And that was done on purpose. So anything above 14 inches uh, would need to go into an engineer container uh, and be grouted separately. So before we dewater, water, we would grout the, the engineer containers, then grout the floor. Um, and that was done all on purpose uh, to keep the, the material from floating up potentially or having some material getting into the pumps at a later date. So uh, moving on to the pictures above water, you can see the, the vertical pipe casing um, at the very tail end on the right. Uh, you can see the vertical pipe casing that are installed currently in the basin. So this is before they were installed. They have uh, sections or they were manufactured in sections. Currently we have two sections installed on each. So we have four vertical pipe casings installed in the basin. Um, and we did that on purpose. So we have limited workspace in the basin. Um, so and lifting capacity of the crane. So uh, having them done in sections was an optimal way of doing the, the installation. And that first or the middle picture on the top, you can see some of the material that's been put into those uh, casings. So um, they did some vacuuming activities of the basin floor. Uh, they moved some uh, smaller, uh, smaller size equipment or uh, debris that was in the basin. Uh, and they put those in those vertical pipes, tipped them over and put them in the, in the, in the pipes for uh, uh, high dose debris staging. Uh, so that's all the debris that would be taken down during demolition after the superstructure is demolished. We would take down this, uh, this uh, vertical pipe casing material out at a later date. So uh, our last picture at the bottom on the right, uh, you can see what we call the North Loadout Pit. Uh, so the pit was full of 80 cubic feet of settled solid. So uh, for folks that are familiar with uh, pool uh, cleaning systems, there's a, a skimmer uh, system for the basin to keep the water clarity at uh, optimal levels for basin operations. So at, at a certain periodic time, they, they need to backwash that filter. Uh, and during the course of having to backwash and uh, transfer that settled solids, the location where they were putting all that material was a North Load Outfit, so we ended up uh, retrieving a significant amount of settled solids from the North Load Outfit, and that was completed last week. So that's a significant accomplishment for the crew out there um, making progress on deactivating the basin. Uh, so there are follow-on activities, but those are uh, all above um, water um, pieces of equipment that I'll talk about one in the next slide. So we have the dewatering equipment that would be removing the 1.5 million gallons of water. Uh, the first picture here, you can see the tanker trucks that are 8,000 gallon capacity. Uh, we're only filling them up to 6,000 gallons um, just for headspace. And and uh, yeah, we can't fill it up all the way to the top. We wouldn't want it to be spilling over. So you can see some of what we call the Connex boxes, but they're basically just shipping containers that have filters. Um, and then piping so we can manipulate the flow of water. Um, the filters basically provide, you can change out the filters to be up to 10 microns down to one micron. Uh, and that's all 
depending on the needs of the effluent treatment facility. Um, so right now we're testing down to one micron, but that may change depending on how good or how bad the water is. Um, <clears throat> so the, the primary purpose of the dewatering is to dewater the basin, but uh, we found that uh, we could use this piece of equipment to recirculate the water. So as I mentioned before, we have a skimmer sand filter. Uh, that's an active system currently, and we want to get deactive, deactivated earlier than rather than later. So we're using that uh, dewatering equipment as kind of a recirculation. So if it already has filters, we would use the filters at, for roughly two to three months um, to kind of have some samples for ETF and um, provide filtration of the basin until we're ready to dewater. So once we're ready to dewater and all the activities are done in the basin, we can change the configuration of the piping and start uh, loading out the water into the uh, tractor trailers there with the tankers. And I just added a picture of what the pumps look like. So there's two of those pumps installed in the basin currently. Um, and we're getting ready to start uh, doing our uh, recirculation activities, hopefully by the end of this month in June. Uh, and then once we complete that, we will start doing uh, fixative equipment installation, which is going to provide uh, fixative installation. But that's uh, at a later point. We've installed it now since we have the opportune time, but it won't be needed for uh, roughly a year. Uh, and then I mentioned something about grouting. So the grouting isn't specifically at this area. It's a grout plant that we have uh, being set up now at the K-West reactor area. And that's just to provide all the, the 1.5 million gallons of uh, concrete that you would need to cover it all up. So we're taking all the water out. We need some former shielding so we can progress with the demolition. Um, <clears throat> going to our next slide. We uh, wanted to talk about the facility demolition activities. So our current um, scope of work now, well, I guess what we completed from the beginning of the task order is the 165 and 166K West um, building demolition. I'll talk a little bit about 166 that are anal analogous to the ones in KE. So that's one of our waste sites that we're currently working on now. Uh, and I'll kind of touch a little bit about the issues there. Um, we completed partial demolition of 166 K West. We left two walls, one on the, on the west side and one on the north, just so we wouldn't affect the, the roadway. So it's pretty close. It's at the very bottom of the K West reactor building. I should have zoomed out a little bit more on that picture. But uh, basically, that road at the bottom, that's our stopping point. We didn't want to mess around with uh, demolishing that roadway prematurely while we still needed it. So uh, we completed only partially dem demo that 166 K West. Uh, and then we had some demo preps of those uh, facilities to the right, uh, the three arrows. Uh, basically, completed some demolition preparation activities uh, on um, those facilities, and then focused on 115K West to do some demo prep. But we're getting to cold and dark on 115K West to hopefully, hopefully start demo demolitioning that uh, building after the K West annex is demolished. So our main focus now. Uh, or our current focus is to demolish the K West annex. Uh, we grouted the sand filter that was used uh, during the ECRITS effort to remove the sludge. Uh, basically, I guess, give a little history behind the, the structure. It was used to transfer the sludge from those engineer containers and ship them out um, from that location out to T plant. Um, and that it's a uh, it's a big feat to, to get to this point to start demolishing the building right after we just used it. So uh, usually it take a while to start demolition of those uh, facilities. Um, so get it gets us closer to, to, to demolishing the, the reactor area. So I'm going to our next slide. Wanted to give folks a perspective of our soil remediation activities. So I'm not going to have a test on what these waste sites are. <coughs> Just give a view of what these waste sites um, are, are basically a size relation to the K East and K West uh, area. Um, so all these sites are completed, excluding 130 KE2. Um, they're all basically met their cleanup levels. We're currently actively backfilling these areas, excluding 130 KE2. 
uh, and I'll be focusing on what we came to on our next slide. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the facility underneath this way site was 166K uh, East. There's another one in K West. Um, so our main focus is, is uh, currently in the K East area. Um, but it was a storage location for um, oil um, that was used as a fuel for powering the generators of the power control building right next to it. So um, they initially removed most of the oil uh, when they deactivated the facility. Uh, but during the course of its lifespan, it had um, obviously it rains at least uh, not too often, but when it does, it wasn't 100% um, sealed from the roof, so water got in there. And uh, what we're, um, we're hypothesizing occurred is that the, the left material at the bottom of the, the residual oil um, was basically uh, the water got in there and, and pressed it all out. So uh, you would think the oil would go to the top since it's less dense, but since it's bunker sea oil, which is a larger density oil, it, it uh, managed to come out of the seams. So we went down to 20 feet below the facility or basically the under, uh, underground tanks for those uh, uh, oil bunkers. And um, this is what we uh, found. So you can see a significant amount of oil staining. Uh, and on the benches that we have on the sides, you can see the two little dimples or two little black spots. That's where we did some potholing to figure out how far it went out from the original design. So currently our path forward is to expand the waste site laterally and go 10 feet deeper. And the limitations are mostly on the reactor, uh, uh, at KE's reactor. So right at the north, you can see two little dimples there where they used uh, those uh, pieces of uh, concrete to hold the walls while they were being erected. So that's the, basically the, the limit we can reach with the layback of the, of the remediation of the site. And there's a limitation to the, to the east with the switch yard. So there's an active switch yard. Uh, so we can demolish most of that floor from the, the power control building. Uh, but if it keeps extending out to that side and starts impacting the switch yard, we would have to stop at that point. Um, there's also, uh, what did they call it, uh, substation, a uh, small substation to the west, uh, but that's significantly out to the west, so we don't expect it to go that far, but that would be our limitation for that way site. Uh, we can go as far back down unless we start impacting um, um, the groundwater activities, so they have some groundwater in groundwater monitoring wells at the bottom section, but it's pretty far away from that site. So we don't expect it going that far, but we have that option to keep chasing it a little bit more. So <clears throat> going to our K East in terms of storage, just wanted to give folks a perspective on how the construction works. So after the, the backfill construction or uh, structural backfill uh, was completed in May of 2022. We started doing the, the construction of the footings for the in term safe storage. So in May of 22, and then in July of 22, you can see that they started erecting the steel structure. Um, and then on August, you can see that they started putting the, the sheeting of the uh, in term safe storage. And in September of 22, we had it almost 90% complete. So in October of 22, we officially completed the ISS of the K East reactor, uh, the second to last reactor to be ISS, uh, excluding the B reactor. So it was a significant achievement to get that far and crews to, to erect so quickly. So I just put a blurb of why we had the reactor building installed in the first place. In the first place, it is to provide animal intrusion uh, resistance and weather infiltration. So it basically has a secondary roof and siding. Uh, Um, and provide some added security and access restrictions. Um, <clears throat> so our final slide, I just wanted to give folks a key takeaways from the presentation. We keep making significant progress, um, uh, uh, statusing, finishing the, the dewatering and, and hopefully grinding by the end of the fiscal year of 2024. And we actively are uh, doing facility demolition and wayside remediation on the site. Um, so we're way, uh, way ahead in our, our goal to get K East. 
um, solar mediation completed, except for that one site on 130K2. Uh, that's my presentation. And if you guys have any questions that I can facilitate. Thank you so much for the uh, presentation. Uh, we typically uh, have a regulatory perspective, uh, then we go to questions for okay. everybody. And I, I'm, I'm going to do a 50 50 here, I think. EPA is the regulator on the other game? All right. Yeah, we're, we're the lead. All right. Yeah. So, uh, Roberto? Uh, yeah. Uh, first off, uh, sorry for joining in a little late, uh, uh, meeting that couldn't get out of uh, earlier this morning. Um, yeah, so appreciate the presentation from DOE and Mr. <coughs> Lopez. Um, and also, uh, just to introduce myself to everybody in case nobody knows me, uh, my name is uh, Roberto Amigo, uh, one of the uh, EPA Hamper Project Office um, cost managers and uh, regulators for 100K. Um, yeah, so we appreciate the, uh, the, the presentation and also the effort uh, working uh, from uh, DOE and the contractors and working through the complexity of the cleanup of the site. Uh, as Manny pointed out, that there are some weak sites that uh, end up to be more uh, complex uh, than anticipated. And, um, you know, we appreciate the, those efforts. And um, while we're signing like a broken record from EPA at this point, uh, we continue to hold DOE uh, accountable towards the milestones, but uh, yeah, again, just a broken record. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so one question that we always ask for any <clears throat> present presenter is uh, what milestones are effective with this work? So, and, and are those on time? Are there, are they budgetarily constrained or uh, supply chains constrained? So. Um, any, any major milestones associated with So there are some milestones, but I, I don't know. Well, well, I'll just say that we're currently actively um, negotiating the, the milestones with EPA. Uh, we're in the final stages, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. We've got 18 folks online and 22 of you in the room to give you a sense of, of the size of the meeting because you're only seeing about half of the noses. Um, and we, get, we do have one person who's only by phone. I want to check in with them in case they have a question because I can't see it if you're raising your hand to try to get my attention. Does our phone participant have a question? Okay, I will assume that's a no. Um, I had you in queue. Yeah. Did you ask your question? I did not. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> okay. Um, so you mentioned that um, you're planning remediation under the under the basin after after it's been grounded and mulched and mm -hmm. disposed. Um, has there been a documented release, and has that been delineated at all, or or is it just you're assuming there's going to be something there? Well, we always go down three feet from a potential waste site, so. It, it, Usually the way we handle things is if there's a, a pipeline, we go three feet down, we survey, um, take samples, and basically say, do we need to go further? And once that happens, we would do an additional design and keep going down. So I would say we would just go three feet down from the basin. Uh, the, the basin was uh, epoxied uh, compared to the K East Basin, so there's not a high risk that it did leak or it is leaking, active leaking. Um, but um, once we get down there, we would take samples and verify for, and keep going down for what we need to. Thank you. All right. So if you're online with us and you want to ask a question, um, let us know in chat. Um, if you're in the room, got Rob, Pam, Rob, and Mia. Pam? Thank you for your presentation. This is so encouraging. Um, so when I started with the HAB, I got to walk into the basin and look down and see the fuel. So it's a long time and a you know, huge complex project. And um, the fact that the risk has been remediated is of um, a high importance to the people in this region. And thank you for what you're doing. You're welcome. Rob. Well, I have um, a couple things that I want to ask, but um, I think to um, make sure everybody is up to speed is that pretty much through all the 2000 teams, we've been working to get the sludge out of the basins. 
backing up. They had feet of sludge in some places, so making it over to T in the safe containers, and it's over at T plant still, right? It's over at T plant. And, and so they got most of the stuff. And so what they got now in the basin is the bottom, okay? And, and it's heavily contaminated. And that um, we had accepted a rod in the past that said that um, they're going to uh, cannibalize all the equipment they can that's contaminated and put it in the bottom of the basin with the rest of the stuff and then fill that basin full of the concrete to entomb it forever and ever and ever. Okay, and, that, and that's the progress we're at now. And this has been 10 years at least, right, Pam? Uh, at least, yeah. And a very impressive what we're doing. And we also hope to have this repeated when we do uh, you, right? And, and some other rods out there are also looking at saying that, that we're going to uh, basically, um, you know, take it to grade level, remove everything there, that all of the things underground is going to be entombed in graft or cement or whatever suitable mixture. Okay, so um, so that now we're up to speed. We're making a lot of progress here. Um, so I, I have a couple questions. One is from the EPA standpoint of view. Um, uh, so all of their sampling and their work that um, they determine whether they've gotten to the target levels that we're cleaning up to is being reviewed by EPA. Mm -hmm. And and you have staff that do this? Uh, no. No, uh, primarily myself. Okay. It's a big job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big job. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you more people. <laughs> um, so then um, the, the other thing is, um, I really like the idea of the explanation of the process and the dewatering. Can you give me an idea? Um, so part of the makeup of the big problem with SLAW that we have in the, uh, all the confronting things we have with WTP and, the, and getting rid of the liquid waste, the LAW or SLAW, okay, this contributes to that, correct? This process of dewatering is contributing to the volume of SLAW. I'm asking because I'd like to know what kind of contaminants are we getting? in our dewatering and filtering process. So the majority is just water with cesium, um, but most of the cesium is entrenched in the wall. So the, the main purpose of doing the, the dewatering and then grouting is to keep the cesium in the walls so we can take all that debris and put it in an appropriate location, which is now assumed to be urdif. Um, so the water is the one that will be taken out of the basins and taken to the effluent treatment facility to be treated there uh, and put in their retention basins. Uh, and as I understand it, they will be taking the water and running through IXNs to remove that cesium content or whatever is still left in there. The, ma the main purpose of our water is to leave it almost relatively clean for those folks to not have to deal with uh, 1.5 million gallons of water in their facility and have to do an exorbitant amount of treatment. Uh, right, it's all based upon physical size yeah. of the particles. So crud, trap debris, sand, whatever that's contaminated will be filtered out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the cesium that's dissolved or ionized will continue through, go to the uh, effluent management facility so right now, depending on how active the water is, depending on how the, the characterization of the water is or the pH level reaching out the cesium. So we have an ion exchange column in the system, two ion exchange columns in the system now uh, that aren't active, but they could be potentially active depending on what we characterize the, the water to be during the recirculation of that water outside the basin, going through the filters, going back. Uh, we find out how bad it is um, and we would run it through the IXN or I, ion exchange columns to remove that cesium. Uh, and they're the exact same ones we use now that periodically run during the basin operations. But we have two um, that are more than enough to filter out the water since all the ones that we use now uh, are run periodically through more than 1.5 million gallons of water. Right, right, so right. if we're only going 1.5 million gallons of water, that, that ion exchange column is more than enough to handle the load coming out of the water. Okay. You can't feed your water. 
Does anybody here know whether or not that EMF actually uh, management is part of the S law? S law being the secondary <coughs> low level waste. Like, you remember, we, we've got this huge thing that's hitting us uh, in front of us, a wall, that we have tons and tons of water and we don't know what to do with it. Okay. I, I and don't, it's called S law. Yeah, I don't think that this is this cave basin water is incorporated into the supplemental low activity waste assessment um and maybe this is a quite but you know i i would think that that would be more of the rl side waste not the uh, sorry or p side waste not the rl side waste um maybe that's something we can get a follow-up on though absolutely so we've got a broad range of ex Hanford experience in the room, and and Hanford is just acronym heavy. So for those of you who have lots of knowledge and lots of history, take pity on folks who are a little bit newer and might get lost in your acronyms. I use an acronym called ROD, and that means Record of Decision. So so that's a that's a big thing for us when we get a Record of Decision at the Department of Energy. Do you have any other questions, Rob? No, no, I was just kind of interested. That's a great presentation. I, I think we've accomplished so much and 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 seeing it all come together. And I remember discussions with people, you know, about these transfer tubes and what do you do with the hot stuff? And, and you know, just I'm really glad to see progress in this. And it's just going to make the next one faster, I, I believe, you know. Yeah, as far as I know, this is the last one we're working on. They're, all the other reactors are ISS at the moment. So this is the last basin, um, the K-West reactor basin. Um, so once we accomplish that, significant progress, risk reduction to the Columbia River, especially if you saw those pictures right next to the Columbia River, we used the Columbia River as coolant water, so pretty close. So, ISS being interim safe storage. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could talk a little about the history of the contaminated soil in this area, in the Key West area. It's my understanding, I think from Shelly Simone, that there was um, a spill or a leak or something into the soil specifically at Key West. And I'm just wondering if you can confirm that or give more information about it. Well, they're concrete piping, steel piping. Uh, we don't know how significant the leak is. So we always just go three feet below the, 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 the piping or concrete uh, structure that, uh, yeah. So if, if it did leak, we would find it eventually at some point after we sampled. And then we would notify EPA that we need to expand the site. Um, but I haven't heard that that have leaked and we have gone further down, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but we do have active groundwater monitoring, so they, they Does our phone person want to ask a question? She asked through people speak up. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> did you did you look at the owl when you're talking? The people on the internet will be able to hear you better. So it's it, it's a little awkward because we we'd more likely to look at look somebody in the face right instead of looking at the owl. Um, Jerry, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, uh, in reverse order from uh, well, look this way, but <laughs> insulted. I'm not looking at you. I'm pretending to look at you, but I'm looking at the chat. Okay. Um, uh, on the, uh, as you look for contamination below the, at the three foot level, um, what process is there, maybe this for Roberto as well, um, for the public to review the characterization data and comment about what the decision is about leaving or mediating contamination below three feet is the first question I've got. 
So, uh, as I understand it, the rod went through public comment. We we have all the remediation goals stated on that rod. Um, so the public already, well, maybe Jason might field those rod questions, but as I understand it, that's where the opportunity for the public uh, is and the record of decision. Uh, and we just work uh, with that record of decision to make our work plans that meet the expectations of that record of decision um, and we meet those levels um, that were already yes. so everything flows down from the rod uh, and if they don't meet those cleanup levels EPA won't sign the closure and obviously we wouldn't sign closure we have to keep going down further um, so if we hold the contractor accountable to, to, to complete the, the remediation of those sites so well, another point though, um, the waste site verification reports get put on the administrative record. As one of my hobbies is when they get posted, I, I find a link and put it on Google or Earth file. So I have like all of the waste sites with their links of their closure reports on the geek. Um, so, but the next circle of review then would be the chance to say, hey, wait, what about this? And talk to EPA and um, I think is the once it's closed and once the document's out there. So you include those on the rap sheet? No. Okay. That's too late for the public or tribes. Um, if uh, because uh, you know the rod had significant openness about um, what it would be required in terms of um, Depth alongside the river of major concern. Um, so I was think that is, yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, I didn't want to interrupt. No, but please you, do. I mean, okay, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. one of the things, and you feel free to uh, support me on this. Uh, after the development of a rod further down the line, is this uh, document called a staff assembly and analysis plan. And from there, we work. Uh, we, we try to coordinate uh, with the tribes, and um, from my experience, it's been exclusively with the tribes. I, I don't know if it's been the same with other stakeholders. Um, and from there, that's where we kind of outline or uh, uh, characterize the uh, um, other like things that you had mentioned that you had touched on. Uh, but that document itself, uh, uh, correct, um, did not go out to the public for. A formal comment period does not go out to the public for a formal review. That's more of an internal GPA agency discussion. Um, thank you for the explanation. May I ask? Yes. Yeah. Um, it has to do with the dewatering. Um, the photograph showed large tanker truck, and I'm not quite sure if I followed you. Um, You've got an ion exchange column for the water in the basin itself already, mm -hmm. but you said there is still cesium going into the transfer trucks. Um, and is this LS low specific activity liquid and um, uh, or if you could just clarify where where's where does the cesium get stripped out in the ion exchange process? So as I understand it, ETF has a waste acceptance criteria. So we meet the waste acceptance criteria uh, during the uh, periodic runs of the system while we were circulating. We do have ion exchange columns inside the basin. We have ion exchange columns as part of the dewatering equipment. Uh, but that's all dependent on how the water is coming out. So it could change with pH changes in water. So we have those as contingency if it doesn't, if it's not going to be able to meet the waste acceptance criteria for ETF. Got it. So you're sampling as it's. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. we would have Great. to provide that sampling to ETF. Their criteria is being met before we send that over to them. And they have more processes to. To, okay. to re yeah. Remember, thanks for. I, some of you probably are aware that there's a relationship or a parallel that um, for removing 
um, low activity liquid after cesium exchange from leaking tanks. And if you're doing it for into a tanker truck, which is much larger than a tow that would be used for a uh, leaking tank, it's there's a parallel here for people who um, are thinking, well, that's you know, can you actually just pump liquid with screen and strontium removed and put it onto a tough truck tow for treatment? And there's a parallel that's being used. Um, and then my third question had to do with the substation. And um, if you could explain, and Erto, um, seems if, if the contamination extends under the substation, um, there's a need to remediate, not just stop and say, oh, we don't want to disrupt the substation. So could you describe? How you're, I mean, it sounds like you're just going to stop if it goes under there rather than um, taking action. So I can speak to that a little bit. So, from the middle of that uh, way site, it's uh, roughly 275 feet to the substation. Um, so, that's more than we expected to, yeah, well. That's more than enough space to, to remove most of the contamination. We're expecting not to have to go that far, but it's an unknown at the moment. So, we, yeah, I don't know how we would handle if it did go below. Um, the switch water, switch water would eventually come out anyways. Um, so we would just probably handle it after the switch water is demolished and we can do the remediation at that point. It would just have to stay open. We would never sign a document saying that. The 130K2 was completed, um, and it would just stay active and remain until we, we could get to it. Just like the waste sites underneath the where K's reactor. Thanks. Thank you for three questions. Steve. Uh, yeah, great uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Um, I was just uh, wondering, just in a Candid note: If there are any um, potential milestones that may be affected by um, some of the extensions of work, I guess as an example, where you talked about you're going to have to go further for the oil excavation, you got some in the pits, and now we're going to go out a lot further. Is there going to be any impacts to the time frame that that's going to also require? And, and is it only oil? Is that at the moment, it's only oil, but we're in conversation with EPA on those milestones, so they're still under negotiation. Um, that's as much as I want to say about the milestones. Um, but yeah, at, at the moment, it's just oil. But we wouldn't take more samples until we knew we can see any stains from the from the oil, because it's obvious you can see there's still more to remediate. So. Um, Thanks. Who else has questions? I don't have anybody in queue. I'm, I'm, I'm Ginger Wireman. I didn't. I wasn't here during the introduction, but I'm on the communications group here. Are you gonna dig up the oil contaminated soil and remove it, or are you gonna clean it like steamers warm it or something? No, digging it up. Are you sorry? Sending it to Erda. Is that where the soil is going? Okay. Yeah, we just have to make sure it's not wet, uh, significantly wet. That's dripping oil. We would need to stay away from it. Okay. To meet their waste acceptance criteria. Other questions? Anyone? We, we're running 15 minutes early. Um, thank you for the presentation and the discussion. Uh, it's really encouraging to see the, the waste coming off the river corridor and, and protecting the river. Uh, appreciate the work that you do. Um, and uh, you're always welcome to come back and talk again. <laughs> so I think we have a break scheduled at 10.15. So anyone object to taking a break early? Jason, are you okay with that? I'm fine with it. I'm, I'm here whenever you guys are ready to start, but I know more people yeah, may not be He's next up. Yeah, we'll, we'll just run 15 minutes ahead of schedule for 
until we don't. Um, so, if, if you came in, if you came in uh, after the official opening, please make sure you sign in over here. Um, it's by the cookies. Have some cookies. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take a break. Uh, come back at 10:15. And thank you, everybody. Well, I just want to thank everybody for your time. I have some training that I have to go back to, so I appreciate your questions and thanks for the attentiveness. <laughs> So, all right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nanny. Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, welcome, uh, Jason Capron, uh, to uh, wrap, and uh, really looking forward to seeing what these are. The last two rods on the river corridor. They are. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, as, as thank you all for the introduction. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Jason Capron. I work with DOE Soil and Groundwater Division. My role is mostly working with the documentation for our circle cleanup decisions. Um, in case I call on a little bit, introduce him now. Elwood Glossbrenner, sitting back here, works with our Soil and Groundwater Group as well. Elwood is our 100 area remediation project manager. And then Caitlin Nelson joined our team about two months ago. So I wanted to bring her over to let her see kind of the, this part of the process and whatnot. We'll be working with us more. So what I what I want to go ahead and advance to the next slide, Ryan. What I really wanted to come here and talk to you guys today about is, is where we're at on the K and the N uh, RIFS proposed plan and record of decision development process. <laughs> A little bit of background to frame that. This may be old news for some of you, but just to be sure we're all on the same page. So when I talk about the river corridor, I'm talking about the area of Hanford, of course, along the river. Um, we, we began remediation in the river corridor of those waste sites back in 1995-1996 under interim action records of decision. At the time, there was a bias to get out and get remediation started, get work going, and so those began under interim decision. That's all that work that Manny was just describing you guys is being done under an interim record of decision. We began the process in about 2010 to start planning final records of decision. And I, I kind of use the term final to distinguish versus interim, just so if, if I'm saying it, you know, rod, there's always a process to review and look at rods, but I'm going to use that term final just to make that distinction that I'm not talking about the interim laws. So we began in 2010 the process for making these final records of decision to get past those interim records of decision, and we broke the river corridor into six kind of pieces to make that in order to do those, those final records of decision. So far, we've completed rods for four of the six. First one was the 300 area in 2013, then came FIU in 2014, next one was DH in 2018, and then 100 BC, some of you might even remember me being here talking to you about that, in uh, 2021. And so what's what's next is K&N area. Those are the two pieces that are left sitting right up here, and that's what I'm talking to you guys a little bit about today is where we're at in that part of the process. So, so let's talk a little bit about the scope of these. Um, first, I'm going to give you the heads up that we're K and N are in process by sheer coincidence right now. They're at the exact same stage right now. That wasn't planned. That just happens to have been how the sequence of events of having lots of work going on. They happen to be right now at the same stage. So sometimes I'm going to speak in parallel. Other times I'll speak a little bit differently. They are going to be separate decisions. So if I tend to conflate, it's only because they're at the same place right now in the process, but we're doing a process for K and we're doing a process for N area. It just happened to be at the same stage. So the scope of these decisions, they're going to cover both soil and groundwater. Uh, for those of you who are really familiar with the interim record of decision, you may recognize that there's an interim record of decision that covers soil. There's one that covers different groundwater operable units. There's one that covers the K basins. The new K area record of decision will cover all of K, groundwater and soil. Same token for N area, the next N area record of decision will cover all of N area. This includes, um, people always ask me, well, what about all the waste sites that have already been remediated? The final decision process includes going and looking back at all of those sites that have already been remediated under interim action. It goes and through the process, the sites that were already remediated, we evaluate them against updated criteria make sure that they still meet the end point for a final decision, or for those sites that weren't quite completed under interim action, we carry them forward. So it doesn't rule out anything just because it was quote unquote already remediated or looks at it all in total. As, as you can imagine, when I said this has been going on, we started this process in its infancy of 2010, and Manny's here telling you we're still actively remediating. As you can imagine, the, uh, the orchestration to be sure that we can kind of keep remediating while still continuing to develop the final rod is important. 
at the end of the day, we recognize that transition element, that there's a stage that we can't predict exactly when the K or the N area record decision will land. And we need to be sure that we can keep the good remedial action going. There's provisions and planning in there that helps us do that transition process from interim to final when it does land and we get into that. We've already crossed this bridge with 300 area, FIU, DH, and BC. So we have a good sense of it. What it really comes down to for you guys is the way the record decision will say is, Keep doing what you're doing under interim until you get all the documents in place to fully implement under final. So that way we can keep the work going while still updating to, to more modern criteria and a final decision. Go ahead, Ryan. And that just photo I put on there, which is the 2021 one. I'm not going to belabor that because uh, I felt like Manny showed you cooler pictures when he was in here and talking to us. So I won't rehash that. Um, so again, decision status that I touched on, same place right now, just through coincidence of circumstances. For, for those of you that aren't familiar with the process, a little bit of a first primer on, on how this works so that some of my words make a little bit of sense. So remedial investigation feasibility study, that's the box at the far left there. The remedial investigation feasibility study, or if I accidentally slip into acronym E's, the RIFS. The remedial investigation feasibility study is the large document that evaluates what needs to be done. It looks at the condition of the contamination. It looks at the applicable requirements and it does all the evaluations to say, hey, what things need to be done. The feasibility study then picks up where the RI says, hey, there's a thing that needs to be done. The feasibility study picks it up and says, what things could be done? You know, could we go dig it up? Do we grout it? It looks at all those kind of alternatives and it assembles them into a package of remedial alternatives that it can then evaluate in order to support a recommendation. So the feasibility study is really an engine, they, and they work hand in hand, we tend to do them as a paired document. What happens is once those RAFSs are completed, then we prepare a proposed plan. A proposed plan is really a summary of the RAFS. It pulls from other sources too, but it's heavily a summary of the remedial investigation feasibility study. The proposed plan is the vehicle by which the tri-party agencies communicate with the public to say, hey, here's, here's what we're talking about doing. Here's, here's the reader's digest version, if you will, and it'll give you the references to go and get more detail if you'd like it. Here's what we're talking about. Here's what we're thinking about doing for a final action. And it uses that vehicle to go and talk to you all and the public at large. After that step, we then use the input we get from the public along with the evaluation part and then the RFS to finally develop the record of decision, the raw, the big, the big accomplishment point for all of us where we can say, hey, this is the sketch rep, this is the actual decision we're going to make to continue to move forward with remedial actions. So that's overview of process. Where we are is these, these RFS documents, we've been working closely with EPA and Ecology. EPA is the lead regulatory agency for K area. Ecology is the lead regulatory agency for in the area, but of course, you know, there, there's actually a little bit of tri-party coordination on all of these because of the way it, it interfaces, you know, it's, it's not my optic to EPA or my optic to Ecology, those are just the lead agencies. Where we're at is we've been working with them for, for quite a while on the RIFS documents to get them to a good stage. We have completed comment resolution with Ecology and hopefully with our meeting with Roberto tomorrow, I will complete the last little small hanging comment on Kate area. So I'm gonna call it a success that we finished working through the comment resolution, which will mean we move to the stage of actually being able to put the remedial investigation feasibility studies out again. We update them based on the comments that we worked through with EPA, those will become available again. It also means that that, that team of folks that I've had working on those remedial investigation feasibility study documents can now turn their attention to developing the proposed plans. So that's what they're starting to do right now is to write those proposed plans that again, are really summaries of those remedial investigation feasibility studies. Right now, from a timing standpoint, um, I know the question you all have, when, when do we get to see it? When do we get to see the proposed plan? Hard to say, um, my team has to develop those proposed plans. I wanna have the time to review them with my team. We need to give EPA and Ecology the chance to review them. Doing the math, I don't see it happening before the end of this calendar year, but if everything went really smoothly and went really perfectly, I could see proposed plan engagement starting as early as early next year. That's obviously, I'm being honest, that's my best guess of it. Depends on how we step through the process. That's just the early stage that I see either of these happening. One, one thing we're talking about in that nuance is, like I said, right now they happen to be neck and neck. A question and an input that I actually interested in some feedback from you guys, maybe when we get to the Q&A part of this is, for your perspectives, does it matter? Would you rather see them both at the same time? If I have that choice, like, hey, sometimes there's some value to be able to look at things side by side comparatively. Or would you say, oh my gosh, please don't do that to us, Jason. We have plenty of things to do. Don't hit us with two documents at once, which is already one line of input I've heard and I, I very much respect. 
So when I get to that Q and A part, if anyone wants to weigh in on that of like sequential versus parallel, I'd, I'd appreciate that kind of input because we're at that stage where we can factor that into the public planning process. Go ahead, Ryan. So I, I don't want to belabor too much into circular ease here, um, but I do want to give you guys a little bit of a sense of what you're going to see in a proposed plan when we get to that stage. Just uh, consider this a primer. I really hope that once I get a little bit closer to having an actual proposed plan going out on KNN, you guys will let me come back and give you a little bit more detail on each in specific. But let me give you a little bit of a primer now so that you know what's coming and you can decide how, uh, what questions you might want to ask me then or anything like that. So again, the proposed plan is really a summary of both remedial investigation and the feasibility study with an emphasis on the feasibility study portion of it. Because what it's really trying to communicate to the public is, these are the things that we thought about doing. These are the different remedial technologies that we could go out and apply and how we could package them together to, to provide a complete remedial alternative. It also is the place where DOE says, this is what we prefer. You know, we, we evaluated these different range of options, but this is what, what we DOE are thinking just to put forward what we think the best solution is. The way it looks at the, the analysis in here is it says in under circle process, there's, there's three categories of criteria. Threshold criteria, balancing criteria, and modifying criteria. And that's really important to the evaluation process. So you're going to see that very heavily when you see a proposed plan. Threshold criteria, there's two of them, and these are go no go criteria. One of them is overall protection of human health and the environment. It has to be protected. If a remedial alternative is not protective, it won't go any further. Two, it has to comply with applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. So it looks at its ability to comply with those. If it can't make that point, then it won't go forward. Next, it looks at the balancing criteria. The balancing criteria is when you begin to get into the engineering evaluation of how you look at the different trade-offs and the different pros and cons of different remedial applications. So the first one, long-term effectiveness and permanence, and all of these come from CERCLA guidance. They come from the implementing regulations of CERCLA. This isn't me making this up, this isn't anyone. This is, this is right from guidance and regulation. Balancing criteria, first one, long-term effectiveness and permanence. The objective of that criterion is to say, hey, once, once the remedial action is implemented, does, does it continue to work? Once we've met those cleanup goals, does it have a permanence element? Is it sustainable? It looks at that kind of thing. Its ability out in the future to, to remain a protective remedy. Short-term effectiveness looks at how quickly can the remedy be implemented and how protective is it while it's being implemented? Is it protective of workers, the public, and the environment while it's being implemented? As you can imagine, some remedies could actually be less protective while they're being implemented. Some more, others would be more protective. It looks at all that kind of evaluation and presents analysis on that. The next one is reduction of toxicity, mobility, or volume through treatment. That's a that's a preference in there that rather that contamination where possible be treated, that it be treated or destroyed where possible. This criterion looks at that as the ability of a given technology or a given remedy application to do that treatment application. The next one is implementability. Implementability is, despite being a word in my mouth obviously trips over, is just what it sounds like. How, how difficult is this to do, both from an administrative standpoint and a technical and logistical standpoint? How hard is a given remedy to actually get out there and put in place in the field? And the final criterion is cost, which just looks at the overall cost of the remedy so that it can compare against other ones. The proposed plan is going to have an evaluation and a side-by-side -side comparison for all of those criteria. The other piece that comes in that the proposed plan doesn't do by itself is the modifying criteria, which is state and community acceptance. Um, those, you're not going to see an answer on those in the proposed plan. The purpose of the proposed plan is to get input on what the community thinks on that. So we use the input that we get back on the proposed plan to evaluate that modifying criteria. This is where the public input influences, hey, should we look at this and whatnot, and factor it into the calculus of where ultimately we work with EPA and ecology to select a remedy. State acceptance is kind of an interesting one. I put it up here to be to be true to the process and the reality of the of the tri-party agreement framework where the state is one of the parties kind of doesn't work in, in the same way that it would in other states and other circle processing. But nevertheless, it is a criterion in there that we end up addressing. Obviously, the state has been much more engaged in the process of this through the entire thing. Go ahead, Ryan. So I'm going to give you just a, a little a, a lightweight primer on K area just to, to whet your appetite. Maybe you should feel some questions. I thought this might go well since I knew that Manny had just been presenting on K. I thought maybe I'll give you a little bit of a follow-up piece, so that's why I chose to focus on K. Again, I'd like to come back in the future and maybe give you guys the more detailed version. <laughs> so K area, the proposed plan, what you're going to see is that there were seven remedial alternatives in the feasibility study. 
again, a remedial alternative is a packaging of looking at the different technologies that can work to clean up to clean up contamination and assembling them together into a complete package to say, this is what we would go out and do to address contaminated groundwater, contaminated waste sites, things like that. So the feasibility study looked at seven alternatives. The first alternative that we're required to include is no action. We have to include that as baseline. So what if we just walked away? So that's included as a baseline alternative. You'll see that there. That's just a guidance requirement. There's then alternatives two through seven, which are just different applications of those remedial technologies. Sometimes there's not huge differences between alternatives. The biggest goal I'm going to try and do when I get to a proposed plan is to explain to you very clearly what's the difference between two, three, four, five, six, and seven without having to read a ton of material to understand this. You can quickly and easily see this is what each one does differently. Because at the end of the day, that's the basis of analysis. I told you that the proposed plan is going to identify what DOE uses the preference. I'm telling you right here today, I don't know what that is for K area yet. I have an inkling, but we haven't reached that point of deciding what a preferred alternative is. Go ahead, Ryan. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the things you're going to see in every remedial alternative so you're going to get a sense. But first, I'm going to touch on one other point that, that I didn't really want to, it didn't work well for its own slide, but I can speak to it here. I told you we started this process back in 2010 to begin the development of the data collection stuff we need to support a final rod. We hit a point in the development of the document where we said we can't keep taking in more data. It's, it's a big unwieldy document. We can't just constantly have the latest and greatest data in it. There's a point where we have to say this is our understanding of the world and we need to move forward with the process and then we'll do true up later. That date for the key area is April 2017. So from the perspective, if you get into reading the RIFS in the proposed plan, and you're going to see this in the proposed plan, it was looking at the world from the perspective of April 2017. That's not to not acknowledge everything that came after that, which just that was the last point where we can bring in data to do quantitative evaluation. There's going to be some discussion in the proposed plan. What that means for obviously Manny's in here talking about all the work they've done in the last six years. But I want you to understand that right up front when you see like, why is there 2016 and 2017 frame references? That was the last date that we brought in data. We have looked at information after 2016 to be sure after, sorry, after 2017 to be sure that there's not a dramatic surprise or something like that. But it doesn't have the same level of detailed quantitative analysis that things before April 2017 do. That's relevant because what I have here is a slide that shows these are all of the waste sites that need a thing done from the perspective of the feasibility study. It's not the same thing for all of them, but these are all the sites that the feasibility study says, hey, we need to look at these and decide what the right remedial application is, whether it be digging more, whether it be looking at institutional control. That's the whole big list of them. But for example, these sites here, they were remediated in 2020. And that area was dug up, it's been remediated, but the RIFS couldn't recognize that. There will be a process in there to true that up, to look at that information to bring it in. But from the perspective of the feasibility study, there's still something that needs to be done for these sites. So that's the totality of the waste sites that you're going to see that need to carry into the feasibility study in K area. I won't blow on the color area distinction until I get into more detail. Elements for all the waste sites that are looked at. Remove, treat, and dispose. Many of these, remove, treat, and dispose is the exact type of process that Annie was just talking about. Going out, I love that I keep pointing at his empty chair. That he's got <laughs> remove, treat, and dispose is the process where going out, excavating a waste site, treating it as required to meet the waste acceptance criteria, and taking the material to hurt it. For many of these sites, that's that's what the rod does. It just says, you know. The team is already under interactions planning to do remediation around here as K-West reactor progresses. Many of these are in active remediation right now. The final rod is just going to say, keep digging. That, that's my honest expectation. And many of the alternatives just preserve that expectation and say, it was working under interim, same criteria apply, continue the remediation process of excavation. We're also going to preserve in their soil flushing in many of the alternatives. Um, Elwood's previously presented to this group and other forums that we, we went in there, these two areas up here used to be where hexavalent chromium was handled in a concentrated form up here at the water treatment works. Those areas had residual hexavalent chromium uh, in soil that went down below the depth of remediation, below the depth of practical remediation, really. So in order, while well, we have a pump and treat system in place, we were just seeing the contamination was slowly bleeding into water, slowly bleeding into water. In order to accelerate that process, we worked with EPA went out and did a change on the rod, on the interim rod, in order to include soil flushing so that we can flush that contamination down to the water and immediately pick it up with our pump and treat system just to speed up that overall remediation timeline. 
we're preserving that soil flushing remedy for those two areas where it already has it. And some of the alternatives look at adding it to additional areas. The whole goal of soil flushing is to clean up rather than letting that stuff slowly bleed down into the groundwater, it's to accelerate that so that we can capture it while we have an extraction system in place and shorten the overall lifetime of the pump and treat system while we have the ability to get rid of containment. It does look at no action for some of these. It looks at the parameters and looks at the details and it says, um, you know, nothing, nothing's needed. Some of these sites were already remediated and I don't show you down here, but like there was a waste site that was remediated here in 1930, or 2013. <laughs> It meets the cleanup criteria, it meets modern criteria, it's good, it will still affirm that no action decision. So that you, the public, can see the information in there that says, we went and looked at this again, this meets the criteria, no further action is required. Finally, it looks at the use of institutional controls. Uh, institutional controls can be a mix of restrictions on deep excavation, use restrictions, restrictions on irrigation. It looks at those kind of combinations as ways if, if material is left. Those are presented in different ways across the alternatives, but you will see those elements in some form in every alternative. So that was waste sites. Now the groundwater piece, because I told you this is a raw that, that this is a proposed plan that will address both of those pieces. All of the alternatives include pump and treat systems. On the next slide, I'll give you a little bit more detail about really where the alternatives start to get into it, but they all include pump and treat. They all also include modern natural attenuation. Some of the contaminants we have in groundwater at Key Area are not amenable to pump and treat, and so it includes a component where we're going to continue to monitor them and watch them as they attenuate, be sure that the attenuate is expected. When you use modern natural attenuation, you need to include institutional controls to restrict the use of the water. So if there's contaminants in there that are going to remain that can't be treated by the pump and treat system that will be above cleanup levels where we're letting them attenuate away, then the institutional control will be there to prevent drinking water use and keep us managing that, that plume. Go ahead, Ryan, I'll leave the next slide to talk about the distinctions. So these are the plumes. Again, 2016 data, data mentality here, just as you're going to see in the proposed plan. The light blue color you see is hexavalent chromium, and it's hexavalent chromium above the river standard of 10 micrograms per liter. The river standard is the aquatic protection criteria. Where you see kind of a yellow shade of hexavalent chromium, I'll point you here for the up there, down there, that is hexavalent chromium about 48 micrograms per liter, which is the drinking water standard. As you can see, hexavalent chromium has <coughs> larger plumes, as you can also see, they're, they're somewhat disparate. This is a function of the fact that during operations, there used to be a discharge trench out there, you can't see very well in here, many of you may know it, it's a mile long trench. The amount of water mounting that came under there created a large contaminant plume. This is the stage that the plumes were at at the time we were doing the 2016 evaluation. This is one of the biggest differences between that you're going to see between the different alternatives is just how they handle these different plumes in different areas. They all use pump and treat to some level, but some of them look at different ways to use pump and treat or not use pump and treat for some of these outer area plumes. So when I come back and talk to you guys about what's the difference between the alternatives, a lot of my emphasis is going to be on how it approaches these different plumes in different ways. Hexavalent chromium, obviously my emphasis there, but there are other plumes, especially near the reactor area, just going through the contaminants. Nitrate plume, strontium-90 plume, tritium plume, uh, trichloroethylene, and then I skip right over the carbon-14 plumes that are in near the reactor too. So all of those are part of the remedial action alternatives that are going to be presented in the post plan. So um, public involvement, I've been alluding to it quite a bit throughout this, but we are required and we'll do at least a minimum 30 day public comment period. Um, in every, my experience or one of these we've done before, we've done an extension. I expect that we will do an extension on this one. That's part of the process we'll work through with everyone. Um, so I say maybe extended, but I expect it will be extended. That hasn't been decided yet. Again, emphasizing that even though I'm here kind of talking about K and N at the same time, it's a separate K rod, separate 100 N area rod. They're separate proposed plans. If you all want to share some input on parallel review versus separate review, I'd appreciate that. Um, and just want to reiterate, as I, as I said earlier, stage right now, I see it coming. I wanted to get you guys to know that we're turning that corner to developing the proposed plan. I don't know exactly when it's going to come to public review. Uh, if you see things like UE's five-year plan, you'll kind of see projections for like 24 and 25, but you're, you're hearing it directly from me where the stage is at. Well. <coughs> I think that might be my last one. Um, I'll, I'll return because I'll let Alicia, I'll turn over to you for a regular perspective. You can hand to uh, Roberto. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Sure. <clears throat> so refresh, I'm Alicia Boyd. I'm with the Department of Ecology. I'm the 100 area lead for the section. Um, so 100N is an ecology lead, regula re lead regulator. 100K is EPA lead regulator. Um, we've been mostly hands off with 100K, but at this stage in the game, when we start moving towards public process and the state acceptance criteria, this is when we've been, we're getting far more involved. And so I was really glad to sit through. I've been working really well with Roberto and Jason and Elwood and everyone on this to learn more about 100K. And then we're doing the same thing with 100N, where we've got our EPA counterparts are getting much more involved in 100N because from here on out, we're pretty much working together on the process. And um, I don't have anything specific on the on the specifics of 100K. Um, when we get to 100N, I'll have specifics. So, but I'm gonna let Roberto talk about 100K then. Uh, yeah, for uh, to reintroduce myself to everybody online, uh, my name is Roberto Arnigo. I'm the uh, 100K. Uh, lead uh, for EPA, uh, EPA lead, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I can reiterate a whole lot of uh, what uh, Alicia had already mentioned, uh, but I appreciate the collaboration between the agencies and um, uh, also, like Jason said, uh, we're look, really looking forward towards uh, your uh, input on the timing of the uh, public comment. And you know what what your perspective uh, is uh, on that uh, on that matter. Um, yeah, that's what I have for now. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of good work happening and moving forward. Um, we've got uh, some time for questions and comments. Uh, so. Uh, I guess. Do, do we have anyone in queue or me? Uh, we do. Okay. I want to check. We've got. Um, as well. uh -huh. We've got 20 people online and 23 of you in the room. Um, for the folks who are with us only by phone, do you have questions? It's really hard to see when they want to talk. <clears throat> All right. I have Tom, Rose, and Deep in queue. If you're online, let me know in chat if you want to join the queue as well. Right. I've got a, a couple things, so bear with me. Um, first, process-wise, um, I think you, I heard you say that you wanted to come back in January or February. Is that or, even um, if it's going smoothly? I could be as early as what September's next one. Um, obviously, a little bit of lead time on that, but if, if something is the right stage, we can come back in detail. If not, probably be looking at more of that next one. Okay. And personal preference, if these are both going to be dropping within six months of each other, I would think it would be more efficient to drop them at once and do a 180 day comment period. So there's plenty of time to process all of the information and you don't have to, to yeah. Um, and that would also give the have time to come up with advice given the, that we have fewer meetings than we did last Friday. Um, so uh, questions though, is there any chance to comment on the RIFSs or is that, do we have to wait for the proposed plans to go? Uh, really the best place to comment on the proposed, on the RIFS is through the proposed plan. Because the proposed plan is the assemblage of information. I stress the RIFS, but there, there's other pieces of information. It's just the RIFS is the most comprehensive. That's really the best vehicle to, to comment on. But. Okay. And then in the um, decision criteria slide where you had the, you know, the short-term and long-term effectiveness and then the bottom had the sort of community engagement. Where does um, sort of carbon cost and environmental justice fit into that new, because that sort of is a newer concept that isn't part of circle yet, I don't think. We tend, we tend to look at it heavily within short-term effectiveness because that kind of carbon cost is about that equipment rolling, you know, that is a piece like short-term effectiveness that if you're going to, you know, have a yellow iron out there moving, there's a carbon cost to that. So it tends to fit in with that one, Tom. And it's that that's been a fun one. You know, we started to address that in DC and bring in that piece of how do you really evaluate that and some of the trade-offs, but that is the criteria. Okay. And my last one is I so wanted to confirm that none of these records of decision uh, impact the actual reactor cores, right? That's a separate process. Correct. The actual reactor core, but it goes right up to them. So all the work Manny's talking about under the basins is currently covered by interim actions, and we just pick it up. It's the final action, but it does not cover the core properly. 
but it does can cover like the contaminated soil under the basins. Thank you. All right, I have Rose and then Dee. Rose, you're online. What's what's on your mind? Um, probably Jason's worst nightmare, but no. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, I did want to share with the group that um, we, Yakima Nation, just so folks know, I'm Rose Ferry with Yakima Nation. We've been working with Department of Energy, EPA, and Ecology for several years on uh, both the K and the N areas. We've we've submitted comments, um, preliminary comments um, on both of those areas um, uh, through through the years. Uh, we, we do have some issues, both technical and cultural, that we are uh, working through uh, with the Tri-Party. Um, there are huge cultural um, issues with both of these locations that we are going to have to maneuver through. Um, uh, the N area has a cultural site that is eligible and it's been, been determined eligible. Um, so we are going to like I say, really have to um, roll our sleeves up and really figure out how we're going to work through um, some of the complications that um, we're going to be dealing with in, in trying to get these records of decision and work plan and such through. There's going to be mitigation. Um, the uh, there's, there's adverse effects to cultural resources. And I just feel it's kind of fair for folks to know and understand that if for whatever reason this isn't moving in the time fashion that people think that it should be that um, we've got a lot of work to do uh, to kind of get through some of the very complicated cultural issues that are going to befall both of these areas, both of these records of decisions. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there so so folks knew that and, and, and just to really let you know that um, you know, we've been working on this for years. Uh, <laughs> with with the tri-party uh lots and lots and lots of meetings and lots of documents that we've gone through um working on the science of things and everything so um we just as a matter of fact had a meeting was it, i think it was last week or was it this week i don't even remember they're they're rolling in so the communication has been good it's been open it's been regular um but it is complicated and so just like i say wanted folks to know that thank you Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Dean. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, good presentation, but uh, I have a uh, uh, couple of questions, and I think Tom addressed a uh, part of my questions, but uh, Jason and the EPA and Ecology, anyway, uh, were working together. Uh, regarding this proposed plan, Jason, uh, you mentioned K and N area, uh, and give a presentation, kind of, more, a lot of things are common. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have come. Call me, I'm there. Call me, I'm here. I mean, both are things. Uh, but a lot of things are different, too. One has the soil passing and those kind of things. My question is from the point of view of reviewing those proposed plan by, by everybody and these things. Uh, if, we, if we get simultaneously bored, at the same time, or even that whatever one month or two months apart or whatever. But one thing I want to emphasize that one will impact the other. The issues, the issues are common. A lot of com commonalities are there, but at the same time, some differences. Those differences and community, when you mix together in calculating your um, technology or as well as well, cultural issues, they already answer. So, uh, my my point is to ecology as in EPA and DOE, okay. You 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 provide those proposed plan to have tribal nation, forget about us because we'll be working with you to it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, the logistic and the schedules and how to move forward from one issues to another and and those overlaps and discussions and uh, if you finish one, that need not necessarily mean that you you are finishing the other part. You know, it's uh, it, it's like so. Uh, from that point of view, I just want to get some opinion from the hard members. You know, it, it is not that two proposed plan you are getting in, um, although you are getting at the same time. It's not one single process. It's a it, 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 that process. I I personally think it will uh, it will inter 
there will be commonality, but there will be a lo lot of interference. Solving those uh, differences may take time. And may take time looking at how the things process here. May take time, uh, may take significant amount of time. That is why what I, 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 I see. So from that point of view, I have Jason and you, you, you are the thesis. You, you are, you are uh, going, planning to have the proposed plan, not before the end of this year or something like that. Um, are you going to take into consideration those aspects when you deliver those uh, the documents and the process to resolve those issues and those things timeline and those things? You already mentioned about that 180 days. I, I think this is a fairly good uh, operation, but I don't know what have things about our issue resolution and interference and come to a common consensus within 180 days or whatever. That's my opinion, kind of thing when discussing here. And, and that certainly that's that's something that we're interested in from a DOE perspective. You know, we previously on the proposed plan reviews, which have always just been individual ones because of how they came, we tried to sequence it pretty specifically with kind of the cycle of have meetings so that they get to have a chance to hear from from a me, from a from a whomever, and then have some chance for some some advice. Um, because of the difference in tempo. We're still pretty flexible on when we issue it relative to start times, relative to have meetings and whatnot like that. It really is that fundamental question for, for, for everyone that there's something nice to being able to look at two documents at once and say, and to do that contrasting and whatnot. And I know I've got a memo, like, oh man, this made me think of something I wish I'd said on that other document. Now I've missed my window. But that also is a it's a workload for you too. You gotta deal with both things at once. And you know, some party sure they're like, man, that's a workload for we want to deal with that's gonna cause confusion. So I respect that opinion too. And that's where, you know, ideas like maybe a longer time period is that's the kind of thing I'm looking for too, of what kind of things you guys might be interested in or preferences, because we'll use that to inform our process. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a decision. We do have to maintain certain public review periods that we're sure we're compliant. Um, but here's a chance for anybody to say how we do it best. So just add what you said. Oh, what, was, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I have, what I'm trying to emphasize is that there must be some overlap. Uh, overlap in the sense that you identify, you finish one, and then you get the look at the second one. Oh, we made mistake in the first. Mm -hmm. oh, and, oh, made that thing. Yeah. And, and not speaking for the head because I can't. But personally, if there is this overlap and this interdependency between the two rods, it would almost be good to have a third. So you have a fact sheet for 100K, a fact sheet for 100 n and then you have a third Venn diagram fact sheet that talks about <laughs> that overlay and what what impacts each other mm -hmm. it's more work for you guys mm -hmm. but it would help disambiguate the two documents yeah that's good mm -hmm. can i ask something i jump in the queue just for clarification newbie how big are these documents that we're talking about not having reviewed either these proposed plans yet because I haven't seen them, I can't answer definitively. Proposed plans are typically on the order of think of about 40, 40 to 50 very meaty pages, but <laughs> they they represent, depending on your level of interest, they come with a lot of references and things where a lot of people like to dig into the history. You know, oh, that makes me ask a question that I want to go interrogate more from this link that's provided. So I think that as a newbie, if you had some familiarity with it, it's like on a, on a good solid day, you could get through it and have a good life. Okay, I, I think I know what's going on, but you could spend a lot more time on that. Basically. I mean, they're full of rabbit holes. Yeah. yeah just, I, I wasn't sure if we were talking several hundred pages. No, no, or, no. Oh, yes. and yeah. if, if you want to read the entire new you're talking about thousands of pages. I think BC was like 180, maybe? For the proposed plan? Maybe that was the wrong. Yeah, I, I think BC. That's wrong. Yeah, BC, I think, was only like 50. Okay. Going from memory. Uh, maybe I'm, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. I wrote it, so I should go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm remembering Dale from the State of Oregon carting around documents that were this big. That's yeah. because he printed out everything. <laughs> uh, and I don't. But uh, so I'm, I'm planning on like 800 pages of total review for each document because I like to go down the rabbit holes and read the foundational documents that are leading up to the point. So, but. I'm like I said, I'm a geek. And, and when we when you talk about workload, it, it's like tell me how big the 
Yeah, it's, and it, it is. It depends on. I, I, I personally, this is just my opinion, that I think to at least get into it in a substantive way, to be like to really have your head around it, some time to process, and to, to put together, you know, have to yourself some time for comments. I think you would want to have at least three working days at the minimum. Um, and you would want some pretty solid time blocks because it's not just, you know, it's not just casual reading. I mean, you know, if we work very hard to put it at a summary level and present information, it, it takes some processing to digest. That's just the reality. Um, like, say, if you're like Tom or like me or others and really want to go down and plan for more. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. All right. So, plan for more questions. I've got four people in queue, and, and it'll just spark more questions, no doubt. It's Tom. You're done. Oh, you jumped you too. <laughs> Pam, Mia, and Rob. Pam. Okay, a couple things. Because we have been through this before in this committee. But in those days, this committee met every month. <laughs> and so please take a look at the proposed work plan for the half because it took that much time for this committee to work through it. So um, so we don't have time to do that with this new structure that has been imposed upon us. So what this committee is going to need to do is to identify what we want to look at and what type of advice we want to provide. And Oregon can do whatever you want, but it's not going to come to the half the way it did last time because it just isn't time to do it. So both from our perspective and your perspective, there is a draft calendar. So Grab a hold of it today. Somebody should have a hold of them. I'll make sure you get that, Jason. Okay. And um, and then we um, need to think about how we're going to get our arms around it in a timely manner. And then also, as we're planning for the next year, maybe we need to modify that draft work plan for something this big. So um, it's a quiet one. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's a high level advice that covers both um, because there's so much overlap with the strategies and maybe there's maybe there's something there that we don't have to go into the details of both individually we could do more high level did it pain you to say that yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> mia then rob mia um thank you so much for going through the kind of details of the process i really appreciate that kind of what we're supposed to expect um i am wondering so we have public opportunity to comment on the proposed plan do we then have another opportunity on the record of decision or is the proposed plan and that's it it's you comment on the proposed plan by process the okay. rod will contain the agency's responses to the comments it's called responsiveness summary it's a specific section of the rod but at that point there's not a, a direct public mechanism to comment on the rod okay and then um the balancing criteria that you mentioned are those weighed um equally or weighed differently it's there's no waiting on it. That, that's a great question, Mia, yeah, because it's, and this is something with, we're all sort of a project struggle. It's like the, the tendency to want to reduce that to a, this one gets a B plus, this one gets an A minus, and how you do that. No, there, there's not a waiting applied on it. It's really a presentation of the information and looking at it collectively. I will say that to look at an individual alternative and read its things, you go, well, this one says this and this and this, what's this all mean? It gets the most power when it's contrasted. Is this alternative has these trade offs? This one has this. That's really what those criteria give you the ability to do is go, well, this one would get the job done faster, but it, it costs a little more and it has some higher risks. That's really what you get criteria. That they not really a score card per se. Okay. Okay, thanks. And I do, I did want to offer a comment. Um, I'm of the opposite impression. I think that um, when presenting these two documents to the public, it's going to be very confusing if we do it at once both at the same time I mean in terms of they're very close together and as people have mentioned they're interrelated and yet when someone doesn't know enough about Hanford and you're presenting it to them for the first time it's going to get really confusing about how is this one different from that one and why do I need to comment on both of these two things separately and on and on so I, that's just my uh, two cents of I think it should be separate to, to focus in, hone in on one and then hone in on another one. Did you need to jump in? I can just be in queue. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Rob. Uh, <clears throat> great presentation. Um, the technical details are right on the level for us, and, and I appreciate that. Um, 
I have a couple of questions. One is, is uh, of all the um, interim uh, cleanups that have been done on the site, and you're going back and reviewing for the formal run, uh, how many of them are you going to have to rework? Oh, great question. Um, specifically to K area, there, there's only one problem area, and that's the mile long trench. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the norm across process more than just broadly. It's usually been onesie, twosie, things that have to be redone because of the changes in standards. But in K area, the one that comes immediately to mind is the mile long trench. And so then I would tell me, would I have then confidence that those remedial actions taken on those other sites meet all the criteria that would be in the final run? Yes, that's that's a really good question because that is the point the, the reality is that for something like the mile long trench we, we've known for a while that un, even under the interim framework that there was probably needed to be a little bit of a revisitation of the mile long trench what we've seen is that we said was remediated quite a while ago but we've seen a little bit of a persistent groundwater plume beneath it and we continue to have a pump and treat system that, that is capturing the contamination off it but from a long-term management, you don't want to run a pump and treat system for years and years and years. And so the question has been there of, should we revisit the remediation that we've done at the trench proper? Rather than coming at it through a change on an interim rod, which would be part of the process, we said, let's address this with the final rod. Okay. So I think the process works. We just chose to use this particular mechanism. And otherwise, for the most part, Rod, we'd be confident that the, the difference between interim criteria and final criteria is, is not light years of, of change. It's updates to certain standards and things like that that we're sure there's not a, a huge night and day change in what the interim requirements were to the final. Okay. Now, um, so, so we have all these dozens of little sites up there you showed, um, and even some of them wiped off. Mm -hmm. Did you show them? Um, First of all, we're getting through the rock declaration is the easy part, actually. Then we got to come up with the gazillions of dollars necessary to implement all of these corrective actions. So, um, and, and money isn't cheap and it's not free, and, and so we have to compete with all the other things out there. So, um, is there a, a, a ranking in these balancing effects for the ones that are? the most critical, um, the most mm -hmm. risky, the most, uh, um, the one that we would basically consider that you would, we would want you to attack first. No, that's, that's a great question. Within the confines of just the K area, there's not a, you would see things like that matter for sequencing. I mean, obviously right. there's times where work sequencing matters and you'll see some information on that, but you would not see a value-based opinion within the context of those plan of this is the piece that matters more than that. So of all those sites, can you give me an idea of what the heavy lift is going to be the biggest one? Uh, finishing the work around K-West Reactor, because so much of this really just picks up and says, continue, please continue doing the remediation that we're already working for the K-West Reactor and continue to finish that process that Manny's alluding to and continuing to do it. That's the biggest lift from a near term remediation is doing that. Um, I don't ever want to dismiss the importance of what we do from soil and groundwater because there, right. there needs to be a pump and treat system. Under all the alternatives, there's going to be a pump and treat system that remains in place at K area for a while. Sometimes that doesn't look as exciting. Um, for, for us, pump and treat systems are they're a really valuable part of the tool set and they have a long term life cost footprint. You know, you think of year after year the operation of these systems. So we always want to try and do things to shorten that remediation time frame. Um, so both of those are really important pieces, but the one that's more exciting, I would say, is the remediation around K-West Reactor. Okay, so, so then I have, this committee can have good confidence that we have the technologies available to actually implement each one of those feasibility study plans that are gonna come out. Yes. Yeah, okay, so then our tool set is complete. The next question I had, and maybe this goes not necessarily to you, but we talked about cultural issues. And, and and there are so many, and we've been talking about it for years, and we got more years ahead of us to talk about it. Uh, cultural issues are kind of nebulous to me, and and can I get some examples of what we're talking about? In um, is it just personnel access? Is it, is it you know what are we talking about with cultural issues here? And maybe you're not the right person to ask the question. I think I think it's some general. I can speak to some of that generally. Um, some of it is about it's as federal entities. We have an obligation to coordinate with the tribes from a decisionary standpoint. The tribes have 
have a, a have a status within federal government relationship that is important for us to coordinate. So we have to coordinate, or at least offer the opportunities to the tribes to coordinate at a leadership level. So some of that is just a function of giving them a chance as, as their own governments to weigh in on the decisions we're making as a government entity. The other part is for the actual cultural resources. There's, there's legal requirements surrounding how cultural resources are managed, and that's one of the regulations we recognize in there. Because of the particular historical and cultural significance of some of these areas, it takes some additional time, and I, I wouldn't be the right guy to get into finer details about what those particular resources and whatnot are wrong, but it's, it's a coordination function that being sure, the idea from a, from a circle guy perspective is that you know, you, you want to limit the harm to do to all, all resources. So if there's an alternative where we can kind of do some things to lessen the damage to a cultural resource or we need to look at mitigations, that's part of the process we need to work through. We're continuing to focus on the cleanup as well. Okay. Thank you. We actually have Rose next in queue. She had a, a response to your question of, around timing, parallel or sequence. But Rose, um, why don't you share your thoughts uh, maybe on more than one thing? Okay, yeah. I, I was having fun listening to Jason kind of, you know, try to do it here. <laughs> Everything he said was accurate. <laughs> Everything he said was was accurate. Um, I, I actually my comment will probably cover both of both of those. Um, in that I I had put in the chat that I agreed with what um Mia had said with regards to um the doing these separately and, and and Jason knows we we had a meeting and we've already expressed that desire um we are we we are in a situation where we have got um contamination and uh in areas that are culturally significant to the tribe um areas that are not just culturally significant but are um in in the in the case of in area like i said before is a traditional cultural property and what that means is that we are going to need to assess the um the remedies um the alternatives to determine the level of effect that they are going to have on cultural resources we already know we're going to have an adverse effect and what that means is that we are going to have to mitigate for those adverse effects because the avoidance isn't possible. We've got contamination. We need to deal with that. So we, we're not going to be able to avoid um, the work that's going to need to be done. So um, and, and we're probably not going to be able to minimize it that much either because it is what it is, unfortunately, which means we're going to have to mitigate, which means we're going to have to enter into a memorandum of agreement. And when we do that, then that means that um, the federal agency and the tribe will sign an agreement um, stating the measures that will be taken to mitigate for the adverse effects to the cultural resources. And, um, it, and so again, going back to whether or not these should come out at the same time, that's gonna be very, very difficult for Yakima Nation to tackle um, both of these at the same time. They will want to work through them individually because they are individual places um, and, and the types of effects that's gonna be happening are gonna be different. Um, in is going to be by far much more complicated, as Jason knows. We've we've had conversations about that, um, and we're still working on some of the the, the technical issues regarding in as well. Um, and but but I guess to to address just slightly what what an adverse effect is 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 anything that is um, affecting the character defining features that makes that site eligible for listing on the national register. So depending on the nature of the site, it may it may be in some cases it could just be um, people's presence out there at certain times. Um, certainly, any any ground disturbance is going to be a problem. Um, you know that's going to be an adverse effect to the spiritual nature of the site. Um, any contamination that's left in place um, that's affecting groundwater and whatnot, which would which is part of the character defining features that make that area because the area just isn't necessarily the surface um but you know those could be classified as adverse effects that we're going to need to talk about and we're going to need to mitigate for um so anyway I, I hope that gives a little bit of of clarity to that um there's other things too but those are just a couple of examples so maybe it'll help kind of wrap your head around it a little bit better Thank you, Rose. Brian. I just had a question for you, Jason, and, and maybe uh, Alicia and Roberto. 
Um, if, the, if the have is looking to do advice on, you know, the what Tom and I were talking about, like kind of coupling them together in a sense, if the comment periods were held um, consecutively rather than concurrently, or if there was some overlap, would the have be able to submit advice to, to you guys and be considered after the after that first comment period were to end, or do they have to be so? Would that have to be submitted before the comment period ends? It, really, from from a from a pure P's and Q's standpoint, to be considered for the responsiveness summary from for the rod, we need to receive the comments by the end of the public comment period. That's not to say that the have doesn't have the ability to submit advice as advice. Um, but just for it to be considered within the context of that public response period, it would be submitted in the period. Okay, I just thought that was good to ask. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a great question. And I, I think yeah. context-wise, I think BC might be the only advice that we got in during the comment period. The rest of them, it was separate, you know, because the HAB has its own response requirements of the TV agencies um, outside the comment response. So, is that right, Can Can you think of? I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. I just know it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the reality. Is BC took a, a fair amount of orchestration on the timing. I mean, I remember Laura, my. Perfectly. So, and that would be part of it on this, guys. When I get closer to having more of a timeline, I you know and recognize that it's a little bit different, or quite a bit different structure now to be able to look at that orchestration and how we can make that fit the best. Dana, do you have a, a PI perspective you'd like to share with the group? Yes, all I wanted to say was um, for the newer members, I know this has been expressed before because I remember Emmy saying it when um, I was new to this group, which was a long, long time ago, that the agencies know when HAB is drafting advice. HAB advice is very important to the agencies and will always be considered. And so I always want the HAB to know that if the advice comes within or without the comment period, it will always be taken very seriously. Thank you. Did, did you call on me? Yeah. Okay. No I, I, had a quick, I just want a clarifying question, actually, um, because Jason, you'd said um, something about, um, you know, probably tackling the um, the plan rather than the RIFS documents would would be the better thing to do, but are you, but the, the RIFS documents are going to be available for people to see and review and, and to be able to look at, aren't they? I mean, this, this group. Yeah, the, the RIFS documents will actually be out. We are going to send the updated drafts out to respective lead agencies within the next two months. I mean, they're in a document production process, right? Um, and then there'll be links directly to them within the proposed plan and thing like that. And then okay. obviously, Okay, yeah, you're kind of cutting, this is kind of cutting out a little bit, the sound was, but so, but the RIFS documents are generally available before the proposed plan. So, right? Yeah, so people would, yeah, so if, if so people would be able to have that opportunity as soon as those documents come out to be able to kind of start getting a feel for what's going on, because there's a lot of information, and especially in the appendices of those documents, that are very valuable for people, some people, especially the the nerdy scientist people, to you know kind of dive into some of that stuff. So I want to make sure that people know that you you definitely do have these these documents to review before we're on that timeline with the proposed plan comment, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Roberto. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify too that the uh, remedial investigation feasibility uh, uh, study. Our, our IFS documents, they're going to be publicly available, but that's not part of the public comment period. But you can get a feel for what the proposed plan is going to look like through those. So right. we get to start our conversations in the committee um, and sort of see if anything's available. Yeah, that's what I was getting at, actually, was the fact that we can get a little bit of a preview of what's going on with them by having those documents. And that might be a, a good way to break up the workload when it comes crunch time and the proposed plans are out, mm -hmm. is if, if you're willing to come and give a detailed talk on each of the RNFSs separately, um, then we have that base layer 
And then when we get that shorter document, we can say, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about. I can talk RFSs all day. <laughs> <laughs> Rob. So, so it might understand each one of those 150 little dots up there is going to get a separate RIFS. No, I, I, are you alluding to the slide that had the waste? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's one RIFS that covers the entirety of the area. So that RIFS includes the accounting for all of those waste sites. So, so, so the cleanup on because the RIFS is going to list a technical document and a process. Are you treating all waste sites as the same? No, they're they're each their own data pool. So, and Rob, I may not understand your correct your question fully correctly, but let me see if I can answer that. For example, within the RIFS, it says here are all of the waste sites in the K area. Many of those waste sites have had a cleanup verification package prepared for them. Tom alluded to that earlier. Um, it will then go and retrieve that information from that cleanup verification package and assess it against the current criteria. It does not pool data from different waste site cleanups. It, it does each as an evaluation and it presents an evaluation for that waste site. The, the chapter that included, I mean, there's three chapters that get into the heavy detail of the waste site evaluations. Okay. With lots of tables. <laughs> Thank you. Steve. Um, thanks, Jason. This has been really great. And uh, one of the comments I wanted to make was on your uh, your plume slide. I really like plumes. Um, it's very descriptive. It gives people a good visualization. And I'm just wondering, um, you referenced the 2016 time frame. Uh, it's been six years. Is there any anything forecasted for updated uh, information related to full sites and what the yeah, what migration pattern looks like? There, there is absolutely updated information available for the public. You know, we continue to do the annual groundwater monitoring reports would be the first place that I'd send someone to see the most current information. Insofar as what you're going to see, what we won't do, Steve, is bring in, like, we do a pretty detailed numerical analysis on the underlying plume data to say, hey, what's the risks associated with this and whatnot. We don't bring in that new data into the numeric analysis. Instead, we look at it and we say, are these plumes basically doing what we thought they were doing? You know, do they basically match up with your expectation? And the answer right now is yes. You know, what the plumes have continued to do is, is in line with expectations. So we don't try and update the risk assessment per se to bring in the newer numbers. We just use the basis that, that 2016 and earlier evaluation said there's a problem that needs to be fixed here. And the general nature of the problem is understood because the final engineering solution for how we do pump and treat isn't done until one, a remedy is actually selected, and two, we have a remedial action work plan, which comes post rod. That's really where we say, here's where we're going to put the wells, here's how we're going to run the piping, and things like that. Until then, the level of design is really the conceptual level that, so long as we understand the things correctly conceptually, we're costing and planning it correctly. So that was a very long answer. Did that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I guess it was just um, in relation to, so you're very comfortable and confident that there is, is no reason to make any adjustments to what we're currently seeing. Not at the level of evaluation of the feasibility studies. Yeah, okay. You know, for the number, for things like well counts and yeah. things like that that affect the big things, no, there hasn't been enough of a change to say, whoa, we, we need to throw something right. else in the mix. Because I know as evaluations occur in when you're digging, when you're out there mm -hmm. and actually moving things around, um, that we're seeing very different numbers, but that's not easy. Dr. Farrar, 1050 Gilmore Avenue. Stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the bell, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by the bell? Oh. one area. So for those of you on the internet, um, Ella was just saying that there's also um, annual reports for the pump and treat system that you can look at to see how, how things are doing up there and they have some blue images as well. So, so isn't Phoenix being kept up to date? Phoenix is up to date. I think um, the most recent plume maps on Phoenix might be one year behind. Yeah. Phoenix is right, a little bit of a lag right. just from data load. But also yeah. their data reports and other things in there. You still, we still use so, those, right? Mm -hmm. yes. you know, we, we could, we could yeah. take a look, um, you know, at, at when we have time. Just pull up Phoenix. Uh, if you don't know, Phoenix is run by p and it has some really good maps. Um, we should have a talk on Phoenix one of these days. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
you can look at the plumes migrating over time. So you can see how much or how not they're changing, how much they're not changing. Um, Steve, I feel the need to give one more answer for you there. So you're right. One thing that wasn't happening in 2016 was the soil flushing work. You know, we implemented in the soil flushing at the K East reactor and now at K West or at the head house areas, not directly at the reactors, at the head house areas. That still fits within the planning because we always were planning to do the soil flushing from the feasibility study. So we had always planned under final action to do soil flushing. What we did was working with EPA was we said, hey, can we pull that soil flushing forward so we can start implementing it in interim now? So you don't see it reflected in that plume map per se, but it was always part of the planning. That hasn't changed. The fact that we've implemented pulled it forward to implement early actually fits very well with the plan we already had. Did we talk ourselves out? Where's that bell? I, it was it the bell. I don't have anybody in queue. I, I hope the bell didn't scare them off. <laughs> okay, so on the agenda we have a break at eleven thirty. Let's take it now and come back uh, at eleven forty. So we're five minutes ahead of schedule. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and your willingness to come back again because. We always like, well, the Royal We really likes data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so really appreciate it. Yes, yeah, so, um, I'll just I'll stay engaged with, with Lindsay on kind of the timing and cadence of things too, where we can kind of see good opportunities. But you know, as always, too, if you're, if you're thinking like, oh, where are we at? Always here. So, yeah. And our calendar thing, so if we can get in line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk through calendar and work plan stuff uh, during committee business, and we'll make sure that this gets flagged. Awesome. Thank you. All. Thursday meeting. Thank you. Thursday meeting is. Yeah, we're going to talk about. Right. Okay. So next on the agenda is um, a draft and advice on transatlantic waste. Um, I am team passed it out uh, out uh, well, last month. Yeah, in the last month. In the last month. Um, so, a little bit of background. Um, Transuranic waste is uh, a material at Hanford that is not going to stay here if we, if, uh, if we can. It has a place to go, okay, and it's offsite, which is good. Um, there's two flavors of transuranic waste based on when it was put in the ground, and um, it's known as pre-1970. Transuranic waste or suspect transuranic waste. Um, and uh, re retrievably stored, which was put in the ground after 1970. So, retrievably stored waste has um, milestones to get out of the ground and out of the state um, into a repository. Uh, when that milestone was last updated, which was 2021, 2022, when M91 updated, anybody remember? Anyway, when, when that happened, we started an IM team to look at the um, the whole picture because there's, a, there's milestones for the stuff that was put in the ground after 1970, but all the stuff that was put in the ground before 1970 is still there, and it all has to go to the same place. So the way it works is once you dig up waste that has um, the properties to make it transuranic. Um, if it was put in the ground before 1970, it becomes new transuranic waste. So it's generated when you dig it up. Um, so that IM team was floating around and um, it has gone through a couple iterations of people and leaders, and uh, but it existed. Then at the last, was it the last one we're meeting or the one before the last? Okay. Two full board meetings ago, Rob brought up a, a comment about um, the place where that true waste is going to go, which is the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, in New Mexico. And um, they're going through repermitting, and uh, there, there was some question about you know, whether it was going to be able to take all the waste and how long it was going to be open and who's going to take priority. There's all of the different sites across the country that have transuranic waste or transuranic-like waste. 
are going to the same spot. There's only one repository for this stuff. Um, in addition, the nuclear weapons complex is downblending surplus plutonium by mixing it with concrete so it's less uh, dangerous if it gets under our hands and less um, concentrated. Um, and that is also potentially going into it. Uh, so uh, we're not the only board that's taking up this topic. Is it Savannah River that just passed their version of advice on WIP um, and transuranic waste shipments and priorities? Um, so since we already had an IM team running and there was some new energy and, and some new sort of perspectives on the topic, uh, we came up with this sort of really high level um, discussion uh, through the advice. Uh, and there's two versions in your packet. One of them has sort of an executive summary in the front and then background and then the advice points. The other one is just the traditional background and advice points. I, I sort of like the executive summary one. Um, it's a little longer, which I know longer is not always good in hand work, but um, I think it's easier to digest. Um, so uh, really what, what the advice is asking the TP agencies to do is to come up with a strategy if, um, that includes uh, the both flavors of, of transuranic, the pre-1970 and recovery retrieval after 1970, um, figure out what it will take to get all of that waste to the repository um, before it closes, and um, <coughs> what happens if it doesn't get there before it closes? Where, what's the storage look like on the site? How is that permitted? All of that. Um, then we are asking them to advocate uh, cleanup waste to go to WIP before um, downloaded weapons. Um, we are asking them to, um, we're asking DOE in particular to talk to headquarters and try to get, um, offer any assistance they can to um, provide information to New Mexico so the permitting process can be smoother and more likely to be, succeed. Um, and also asking our local DOE offices to talk to suggest to headquarters on our behalf that it might not be a bad idea to start looking for a WIF 2 um, and go through the process to figure out what plan B is if WIF is shut down before the mission's over. Um, it took 20 years from inception to permitting uh, for WIF to operate, and you know, 20 years is a long time when you know, to, to do a lot of process and not ship waste. So that's where the advice started and where it ended up. So you um, had a chance to read it. Uh, a lot of you were on the IM team, so um, you've already seen it. But uh, wanted to see if there's any questions, any, uh, if we wanted to do some wordsmithing, we can, what the general feeling on it is. Uh, yeah. What's the objective for today? Ah, that's a good question. Um, the objective today is to determine whether or not um, the RAP wants to send this advice to the full board for consideration. Um, so that would mean everyone in RAP can live with it and everyone agrees that it's, it's the right time to do so. So is there a version A and a version B? Yes. Okay, I only grabbed A. The I... difference is version B has the executive summary and version A doesn't. That's oh. the only difference. Okay. All right. Well, I'll speak for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was on the issue manager team, and I think it's excellent advice. Um, and um, Savannah Rivers advice, they've got the book on the <laughs> So I can imagine that they want that material to go to WIP. But I think it's for us, that's the next stage. That's a different program. It's a different material. And um, so, so I have been following the progress with the expansion of WIP. And it's going very well. And um, so they are putting in a new um, ventilation pipe, uh, a new ventilation system so that it will operate safer than it did previously um, because there was a fire that caused some, uh, some damage underground. 
and it um, reduced the ventilation. So it reduced the amount of work that they could do safely. So with the new ventilation system, they will be able to operate more efficiently. Um, there is enough land within the Land Withdrawal Act to take the EM cleanup place. They don't have to go back to Congress for that. So it's just a question of the state of New Mexico negotiating with the Department of Energy. And they're in that process. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, so depending on who you ask, um, with, uh, could be open until 2035? Or 2054. Or 2054. Or I've, I've heard some people saying that it could stay open until 2080. So, like, there's there's some uncertainty there. And when there's uncertainty, you know, it's better to have a plan B. And, and, yeah. I believe there's a 10 year renewal permit process in New Mexico. It's, yeah, and it's, it's the same permit as sort of our revision, our, our Rev 9 that we're working on. Yeah. And, and it's already um, for four to five years late on the revision. And so in the process, they're measuring there's reluctance with governor to signing it. And there have been some statements saying is, why are we the only place getting this? And and so every 10 years, we're gonna get the same. So I don't think it's totally assured that we're gonna be down there. As a matter of fact, there was a weapons complex monitor uh, story about how they want to close down um, more sooner than what we thought so um so i think that's 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 just horrible because <laughs> uh, i don't think we can beat that time frame if that happens Let's okay i just wanted to step in it looks like we may have missed the agency perspective i think that it's great that you guys are ahead of the game on the true um, waste advice um, we talked about this a little bit previously and on the issue manager team call. This is an item that's identified for the FY24 work plan, and DOE would like to bring a briefing to the RAP, to the CAR. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's welcome. Um, I just didn't know if you wanted to um, have additional information from the agency perspective prior to submitting advice. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, offer was on the table. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's definitely something to consider. I, I've been trying to think about whether there's any information from the agencies that would change the overall high level nature of the of the advice. I mean, we, I, yes, we want a briefing on it, absolutely. Okay. Right. Um, but I don't know if it's I don't know if the, the advice can wait because right now is when RIP is going through the upheaval, a well, lot of yeah. permit. And we all know permitting is fun, right? Ecology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's smiling. So, and and it is worth noting that until the new permit gets put into place, the old permit is active. So they're able to keep operating, sort of like Hanford and Rev 8C and Rev yeah. 9. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, I'm going to say that we've got a lot of new members on the board that are not on the IM team, that are not on the RAP. So even if we take it to the board meeting for a full board meeting time. discussion, mm -hmm. it will not be ready for consensus because we've got to educate the new members for what they are seeing, what they are receiving and reading so they can make an informed decision mm -hmm. and support it. Um, so that presentation will definitely, to me, will be needed and we would need to, the wrap would need to help educate in addition to presenting this. So, because this is a, comp as you said, this is a complicated situation. And this is something where we're butting up against previous had practice and the COVID reality of the have and where we are now. So, in the past, the technical committees would put forward high level advice that's not technical, um, which I think this. Is pretty close to being not technical. Um, and the IM team lead would provide a slide deck at the full board to give the, the technical, enough of the technical background so people can get on board with the advice. Um, but we also met a lot more. So, you know, if we're now looking at, if this doesn't go in August, which I'm 
you know, I've thrown this to the wind and it's, it's not my baby anymore. Um, but if this doesn't go in August, then that's not going until beginning of February. Beginning, okay. beginning of February. November. November. Maybe November. Okay. Maybe yeah. November. Yeah. This and is your draft. Thanks, thanks, yeah, the draft has a the draft work plan has a meeting in November. And do we have or do we take a look at the calendar on Thursday? Make sure we have the true waste briefing built in there before the November board meeting. Could the true waste briefing happen in August? September. Remember, you wanted to move from August to September. No, I'm talking to full board. Oh, I should so, ask. So the card meeting or the agency update agency briefing at the august meeting this year. presents the mm -hmm. advice to the hab for education and understanding and review and, and, and either passes consensus or it goes to november yeah like i said i just i don't want we've got so many new members that are not they haven't been around we've got a lot of new members that are not Hanford fluent, and I want to make sure they have the opportunity. I, 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 I think, though, let me just interject that um, this is where that background statement comes in that's explaining those technical issues in brief. Okay, and, and I think that when we say what, first of all, paragraph, what is transgenic waste? Two, what the, what the legal but the thing with DOE is third paragraph, you know, where are we going to do it? So I, I think that it's structured within the advice to educate everybody if they read it. Okay. And and I think that's enough. But my one comment in on this is that I truly think that we need to separate pre-true with after 73. I, I think that pre-true needs to be a completely separate advice because it's going to involve characterization of stuff that <laughs> you know it's going to have it, it's a completely different level uh, of information because right now the truth that we know we got okay is pretty well characterized mm -hmm. and we know we can send it down there and we've got all the confidences but in that pre-70s the non-retrievable waste there's discoveries in there that which really gives some problems. So I, I just see those as being two separate pieces of advice because we want a nice thorough inventory of anything that's being left in the soil for years and years and years. It's got transuranics. I mean, that's it's just our responsibility. So, so first to Sue's comment and, and then okay, here. got it. Um, <coughs> if we have a briefing in August and then half the board gets replaced packet and we have a whole bunch of new members again we'll never get there if new members are always going to be a challenge and i, I don't I, think you should hesitate I, then i'm going to because like i said i'm going to advocate on behalf of i advocate on behalf of the board all board members not just oh, the sure. the old timers those of us that have, you know that have been around for a while that understand what trans is or what the topic is um so I'm, you know, I, I support moving forward to put it on the August agenda. I support putting it forward to educating the board members and idea and, and desire to go for an August consensus decision. I am not saying not to do that. I'm just saying let's, I, I want our board members, the same as you do, to be able to make an informed decision yeah. and feel comfortable with that decision and add respect. I think it would be important when, when and if we present this, we give members the option to say, "I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this yet. Can we can we put it off?" And that's part of consensus. So, so could we just when we before this discussion happens in August? Could we ask for the briefing that DOE is going to provide to us? Have them give it to the whole board versus a committee. Like have that briefing come to August in the board meeting? Yeah. That's what I understood that the request was. So yeah. 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 Okay. Excellent. And before we jump back to you, Rob, you respond to your point. I see the desire there. My issue is all of it's going to work. Or with two. So if if you break it apart, then 
they're missing the big picture, which is what we're asking for is for the, for the agencies to figure out what the big picture is. You know, I, 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 the fundamental reason why it's divided between 70 and pre 70 is because we don't know a lot about that pre stuff, right? It makes and, and, and I don't know that it would fit Carlsbad. Hmm. I don't know that that could happen because there are, you know, yes, yeah. there's lots of stuff buried out there. There's words that we're not supposed to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like yeah. yeah. Pieces of fuel. Oh, yeah. Pieces of fuel. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I hear you. I do. I think characterization is part of that assessment of taking the project management plan, which is the document that tells everything about true. Right. Um, and, it and getting down to really knowing what we have. So that's, that's kind of my feeling about separating the two, just because it's going to be, a, I mean, right now, that pre-70s, it's very, it's not hurting anybody. It's very sad. Not that we know of. Not that we know of. Okay. And so, yeah, yeah. But, and characterization is going to be some of the first. But the point is, is if we can do something nice and simple on what we already have planned, that we have, you know, we got boxes sitting on pads out there saying, okay, this could meet it right now if we're ready. I just think that, that everything would slow down. There's all. And I know, I know in the past, ecology has been concerned that we Is have. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. You finish your comment. Mine's on a whole different thing. That, that we have milestones and a schedule of shipment that is reasonably anticipated to be achievable for the M91 waste. Right. And then we have to also fit in the pre 1970 waste into that stream, and that might break things. Because there aren't enough trucks on the road to get everything to do it by 2050. Yeah. Okay. We've got a queue. Let's go to the queue. I've got Ryan, Jan, and Lindsay. Uh, first off, if there's any specific questions, advice wise for ecology, right now we do have Eddie on the call who's who's provided some feedback to you guys so he can answer any questions potentially that you guys might have. I wanted to go more for the just the the August have meeting potential and just offer that um the August have meeting shouldn't be the first time people are, you know, they're sitting down in person. That should be the first time they're seeing the piece of advice. We need to make sure that we're sending it to them in advance and requesting that have members read it before the meeting so that they have some kind of understanding of it. And then, if, and then also could even include contact info for the IMT members. That way, if they have questions before the meeting to understand it better, they can contact you guys. That way, they're not coming into the have meeting completely blind. Yeah. The standard practice would be to go with the packet. Yeah. And I just want to piggyback off of what you said, Ryan. And Jan, I don't mean to step in front of okay, you. Okay, I can wait. Okay. Um, I guess, like, process wise, you know, the agencies would bring that briefing to the committee. The committee would then form the issue manager team, which it sounds like it happened several years ago, correct? You guys are working on the advice. But then the committee would then have that informed information to share with everybody, right? And then build their advice. It would be approved in committee and then go to the board. So we're kind of working on a process if we skip bringing that briefing to the committee and take it straight to the board. Um, I'm not saying it's not doable. I just want to make sure that that's recognized. So I think the last true briefing for this committee was like 2021. Yeah, it was right when M91 exactly. was being renewed. Right around the time the the issue manager team was uh, was originally formed, but I mean that was a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I, I I know what you're saying, and if if the briefing substantially changes the advice, um, obviously we would get to that point pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, my crystal I don't have a crystal ball as to what the briefing is. I, do I. I can't imagine that there's anything that could be presented that changes us recommending that DOE talks to each other. Um, I understand, <laughs> and that's not necessarily time sensitive. If they're also saying talk to New Mexico, it is. Sorry, again, I don't want to keep. Yeah. You know, this is such an interesting question because there are so many competing and like different priorities being considered. 
I really enjoyed what Sue was saying about the new members, but you know, if they can't learn it in the meetings, they're not gonna learn it at home. I, I think that we have asked every new member to list two committees they wanna serve on, and then we might see them either at the meeting and we wouldn't even know if they were online. But I think probably the facilitation team can let us know if people have signed up for committees and are actively engaged in the processes that the HAB has identified as priorities. And, you know, the River Plateau Committee is one venue and the Tank Base Committee and so on, you know, whatever their new names are. So if people are getting involved with this, they're going to learn the vocabulary, they're going to learn how advice is brought forward, and it's going to get brought forward. So since we're a consensus board, the requirement is for people to either get along, to go along, to get along, and agree to the consensus process or they have to be well enough educated to be able to articulate why they don't and that's a good thing that's a good thing for the new members to be able to ask the questions or submit their objections whatever they are or um propose some alternative so i'm not afraid of bringing the advice forward if we can get consensus on the committee level and here's the next big thing right when do we have the next committee meeting it has to be approved before it can go forward and if we only have three or four meetings a year then that much has been delayed for the benefit of some people that won't have any more opportunity to learn about it probably in the meantime so we are post pandemic now. We have to learn how to get going again. And um, if that means more meetings, which I think it probably does, if that means more have meetings, and I think it probably does, and if it means more in-person briefings, um, I think that all of those things will benefit our outcomes. So um, be bold. So I'm hearing that we want to make sure that everyone at the full board meeting, if this comes forward, is aware that they have the ability to press pause. And they have the ability to ask what they think is a stupid question that isn't a stupid question because there are no stupid questions. Um, I also hear that we want to get this, if it passes out of graph, to those members as soon as possible and maybe have a point of contact who is on the IM team who's willing to answer any questions that people are afraid to ask in their full board meeting because they don't want to sound like they're asking a stupid question. Um, so I think that we could do all of that. Um, so I guess the question now is in that, do we want to recommend to the EIC that this or a wordsmith version of this that we're about to wordsmith in the next half hour um, go to the full board with that understanding that we've also requested a, a briefing on truth um, which would come up before the if if we can make it happen and that's a lot of those i uh, i know um, if we can make that happen then we're getting tpa agencies briefing we're getting a topic on the same uh, have advice on the same thing as the briefing so it's fresh in everyone's mind and they can say oh that's what that means you know we can make those connections in person and then have those people say i really can live with that and they can digest it real time if they haven't had a chance to call the im team and say what's this i just i just wanted to ask and i, I can't remember because We've had a lot of iterations of things over the years. This, I'm Ginger Wireman. I'm with Ecology for anybody online that hasn't seen me. Um, and, you know, like to, to prepare people, what materials can be sent ahead of time? And I can't remember, did we end up that any meeting has to have a DDFO? Like if they wanted to have a meeting, okay. Yeah, Kurt Baca guidelines. Yeah, but what about? 
bouncing, you know, you guys have a shared drive. What about bouncing conversations back and forth via email? Or we hear the documents in advance. This is what we're going to talk about, new members. Please feel free to call me Tom, or whoever. I mean, is there anything that prevents us from educating people outside of the meeting context? Prevents you, excuse me. It's, it's grayer, but like if, if we say, call an IM team member, um, that wouldn't be a meeting, that would be a conversation, right? Correct. It's great. Um, we wouldn't want to have six people on that conversation, but if we had one-on-one -on -one conversations to answer questions, that would be acceptable under Honda, right? Correct. And, you know, how I see it is that there's a meeting where facilitation is required, and that's kind of how I see the need to loop in the DDF up. Okay. And I'm going to just kind of tag on just a little bit. If you send that email out to kind of the gray area, if you include Lindsay and the other agencies, that way they are informed on what's going on. Yeah. And the, so from a FACA perspective, she's protected in the fact that she knows this activity is going on and how far she wants to be involved, needs to be involved to kind of yeah. protect the agencies specifically we're not scheduling a meeting but if you want to call me i'll talk to you yeah. and i think for transparency it's really helpful for me to know kind of what's going on what's being requested because i can't help track things down and marianne can't and marianne's amazing at tracking everything down right now and so we can't do that if we don't know Absolutely. and so the more i guess leave or you know mm -hmm. time you can give us to do that the better so now that i have a request for an august briefing and true waste i can go hunt it down tomorrow so and then I'm going to go plan B, worst case. Oh no, because that's, you know, sorry, but we have a wrap meeting in September. Maybe. Yeah, right. September. Currently, currently it's August, but it might turn into September. Okay. We're, but yeah. we have, there is another wrap meeting. There is another wrap meeting before November, correct? Before November. And then we have the November board meeting. Right. So plan B. I'm also willing to put my teaching hat on and do a, you know, five or ten slide deck presentation on the background of true and all that. Yeah. I can do that. And yeah. we would like to present as well, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no. I'm just saying if if we're getting to plan C. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is no DMV, yeah. right. right. Okay. So question on the table for the next 20 minutes is what can we not live with in this document? What needs to get fixed? Yeah. <laughs> it's very minor. Um, the P copy of the PMP yes. on page two, it's not the first time I, you... I missed that, yes. I, and I, I, right after I hit send on the email, I realized I missed that, so thank you for reminding me. Yes. <laughs> um, the first mention of PMP is not defined. Project management plan? Yeah, exactly. What paragraph? The third to last. The, it says the Washington Department of Ecology responded to New Mexico's request. Um, oh, you have a different. Um, yeah, no, yeah, that's confusing. Oh, okay. oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, Washington yeah. Department. We'll just respond to that project management plan. This one. Yeah. Yeah, just that's okay. a good change. Yeah. What do we feel about splitting out pre-1970? And do we feel strong enough that it needs to get split out that you can't live with it as it's written? I, I just, again, I'll say because it involves characterization and a bunch of other activities, I think we can be more specific if we had a singular advice on pre-70. Yeah, and that's what this issue manager team started as. And we added this because it's more timely. Um, so, yeah, it became a little more high level than not in the week, which is what I think we'll be more shooting. I, I, I think because the um, true waste, we already know the requirements. We already have a bunch packaged. We're ready to transport. When the windows start to open, 
and, and we can get it out of there. Um, I, I think that's a pretty straightforward. I think that the pre-70 ways, being that it is more complex, we probably do need a DOE uh, presentation um, separate on the pre-waste and a description and what they know about it and what, you know, what, what that is. I think it's completely different. I think I'm not the only one who is more concerned about the pre-70 waste than the stuff that's in the 91 fit in with. And that's what the impetus of this whole group was, that that pre-70 waste needs to get characterized so it can get on the whip schedule. Right. And then we added on the rest of it. And, and for those of you who are going to your uh, National Academy meeting, thank you for thank you. Thank you. staying as long as you did. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm is a is a possible path forward this advice and then a follow-on for pre-70 i mean there's sure. there's also more advice to do on just central plateau characterization so maybe we say this is this but we're also going to speak up about central plateau characterization later can you look at that so we'll do a yes and. Problem solved, right? Does okay. that change the Does that change the document in any way? Not really. Not, not really. I, 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 the only thing about the document is, to say it again, to try to get people to read stuff. Mm -hmm. It's got to be skinny. Do we like the executive summary or not? There's two versions. One has an executive summary that's an extra three paragraphs, and the other doesn't. So the executive summary is a paragraph and then the four bullets of advice right right up at the top, the four background. It's what we did with the you know. kind of priorities. It's not something we've done recently in the past. Um, I understand its merits. I mean, if you think that um, people aren't going to get through or, like say, read the, the whole thing, uh, or if you feel without the background understanding before the advice, which they both have, um, but yeah, smaller problem done. <coughs> so, yeah, yeah. I like the executive summary component, same as I did with the cleanup priorities, because the lay person, the average citizen, the lay person, the non-technical person, the managers. Give them the executive summary and it's just it's short and sweet says what this advice is all about sets the tone and then you can go in and dig into the details but it's the same as if you have a large document you have a document you always have an executive summary to kind of distill it down and make so when you open that thing up you know what what's going on right. i move leave it in executive summary yeah okay anybody object I can move it. There you go. Any last, any more words for thing that needs to get done before we consider for consensus? I, I would um, put question marks after some of the questions and the advice. Okay, like question. what happens to true M waste that is orphaned? What happened? You know, no. we should put question marks after. That's a good question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Good. The second one is, Josh, I'm going to have to add. So it's, it's saying what we don't know is what happens. It's not saying, it's not a question. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. because it's discussion of. It's discussion of what happens. It's not a standalone sentence. I'm not sure. It's okay. Right. Yeah, so grammatically, you wouldn't put a question mark there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the technical letter is whispering in my ear. The, the intelligence is over here. Okay, anyone on the internet have, uh, since you have like a Word document, uh, have you seen anything that needs to get fixed that you can't live with? We've got 16 people online. Not getting anything. Yeah. I mean, we got we got 13 minutes to think about this, um, and we're still on time. So, 
Um, I know I'm hungry, but I, I think this is more important than getting lunch early. Um, if you're Dan Solis. Hi, Dan. What's on, what's on your mind? Yes. Hello. Yes. Good morning. Um, Am I getting an echo? We're good. Okay. Uh, no, I just want to say I think it's, it's a it's a fine piece of advice. It approaches the problem at the stage that the problem is at. Uh, I think we even after this advice is issued, we need to keep a close eye on it, and someone needs to review the reply to the advice uh, as a, as a committee to to make sure we get a satisfactory answer because this there's a great big huge question mark unknown as to whether or not we're going to be able to get get that other uh, true waste and trum waste off site. But it's a fine, it's a fine piece of work and, and thank you all for doing it. Thanks for the input. Last paragraph on uh, page two. Last paragraph on page two. Where it says tenuous promise, I suggest that we strike the word tenuous. Okay. Okay, sorry, that was behind you. Last paragraph on page two. Last paragraph, page two, okay. There's a tenuous that Jim would like to consider and strike. Page one. The tenuous Page two. <laughs> yeah. Here. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Any objections? Yeah. Don't like my curls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, that's yeah, it's fine. kind of like a, a it's, value. It's, it's a flower. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's certainly a flower. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Chris Sutton did have an email uh, with some comments in it. Um, I'm going to let those get addressed in the full board if if we if we get out of committee. Uh, is the person who made those suggestions a member of this committee? He is, and he didn't say he couldn't live with the advice as written. It was just suggestions, and it wasn't a specific suggestion for words. I think it was a global an idea. Uh, well, so that we might, have the time. We should probably deal with committee members' issues. He's he's out of the country at the moment. It's okay. He wrote something. Yeah. 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 So Rose typed into chat, I like having the summary and think the advice is sound. I know that's kind of small print up there for you in the room. Okay. Chris Sutton said uh, in general, waste management and disposal is not one of my areas of expertise by long shot, so my comments may not be very relevant. Um, let me attach the budget planning guidance. Um, and she was talking about the number of shipments we can handle. Uh, it's not clear that you know, can unilaterally do much, which we're asking Hanford to work with other EM folks to work through it. And then says finally, the 2025 budget guidance gives the names of two individuals uh, the director of OMB operations. At the Carlsbad Field Office and Office Director for the National True Program at Headquarters, and they should be included on the list of CCs. So, actually, that makes sense. That's good. Do it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Get those to me. Mr. J. R. Strobel. O E P E L? Yep. O L E. <laughs> o spell again. S T R O B L E. Carl's Bad Fuel Office. And Dr. Justin Marble. M A R B L E. And did uh, and Carl's Bad, uh, uh, Office Director for the National Truth Program at Headquarters. And did um, Chris Sutton say something about adding the budget? It, uh, isn't that what's happening now? Is that we're not doing like budget advice and so the budget issues are being appended to the to the advice. I think we're still going to do cleanup priorities advice and I think what he's saying is that this was referenced in the cleanup priorities advice. Um, Not to put it right. right. <clears throat> I think that's my understanding. So but 
we've answered his I, I think, issues now, right? Yes. Him not being here is a challenge, but I can't speak for it. But I mean, he will have a chance. He would have a chance in August. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, do we have consensus to move this to the EIC for inclusion in the August board meeting? I hear. Yes. Okay. Any objection online? Anybody? All right. Lunch. <laughs> let's, let's give it, let's give it two minutes. Let's give it two minutes just to make sure we're absolutely crystal. I don't want to be. It takes a while sometimes to figure out where your keyboard is. I, right. I've had that problem. Um, so if you're online, the chat is your friend for input right now. Okay. And if we don't hear from you, well, we're taking a lunch at 1225 until 2. 2, like, we're, we're in our seats ready to be briefed at 2. That's what we have left for briefing. So uh, what's going on that uh, I wanted to be a part of? National that? Academy of Sciences is having a meeting on their analysis, or FFRDC's analysis of supplemental low activity waste treatment and disposal options. It's going from 1 until 6, or 5.30, yes. And it's at uh, WSU. WSU. Oh, so it's basically right it's here, here, too. Right yeah. on the road. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me ask a question. So they're looking at, at ground, right? They are actually looking at off-site and off-site ground. And community members should go. That's Rob did. Yeah. Right. Okay, Rob. So that's that's oh, why we wanted to get this done. Yeah. 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 That's important. Absolutely. Yeah, very important. Um, not that WESF is not important. <laughs> um, it is an unfortunate scheduling thing that National Academy didn't talk to the half. <laughs> so, like that same room that we have meetings at? Um, and I think the comment and discussion starts at four, and everything else in there is just sort of three things. So, as soon as we finish here, we can get over. It. Oh, so that's a start. Well, that's oh, when that's when one. that's when like the question and answer part starts. I think. So they're briefing the second. From one to three, okay. from one to four. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, um, it's twelve twenty-five. Uh, we'll pass it on to the EIC. If you have any minor entity stuff, uh, let's make sure it gets grammatically spell checked and whatnot. Okay. So, <laughs> and thank you, everybody. <laughs> She went to that other meeting. Happy two o'clock, everybody. <laughs> um, I think the owl's on and yeah. audio is good. Yell at me if you can't hear me. You should be good to go. Okay. Yeah, we've got 13 people online. All right. Well, we lost some folks to the National Academies, which is foreseen, but um, we uh, are glad to have uh, Gary Piles here from DOE to talk about uh, progress going on at WESIF, uh, Waste Encapsulation Storage Facility. And uh, the floor is yours uh, once we get the slide, once Ryan left with the. Yeah, leader <laughs> The mouse pointer laser. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. Because then the people online can see the point. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're leveraging some technology here. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you need to put that down? Okay. Nice. All right. Thanks. Hi, All right. Can you hear me okay online? Then? So, so again, my name is Gary Piles. I am with the Department of Energy Regional Operations Office. I work in the Projects and Facilities Division, and I am the Federal Project Director for the Cesium and Strontium Fly Storage Project, often referred to as the W135 Project. Um, today, yes, today I was asked to give you a briefing, kind of talk a little bit about the Cesium and Strontium Fly Storage Mission, uh, kind of talk about the process for the transferring and then kind of the status on where we're at with the project. I'm going to cheat a little bit for the first two bullets. I actually have a five minute presentation, which I've actually we've shown to the half before, so it should be new for some of you, but uh, 
Um, it kind of does a good job of kind of walking through kind of the history of the waste and capital storage facility and the capsules, talks about why we're putting them uh, or moving them from the, the pool sale and putting them into a dry storage configuration. And then again, walks you through that process. So um, go ahead and, and show. The U.S. Department of Energy and contractor Central Plateau Cleanup Company are reducing the risk in the 200 East area of the Hanford site in Washington State. Engineers have developed a safe and compliant process to remove 1,936 highly radioactive cesium and strontium capsules from underwater storage inside the Waste Encapsulation and Storage Facility, or WESIF, to a safer dry storage configuration. In the 1970s, cesium and strontium were removed from waste tanks at Hanford to reduce the temperature of the waste inside of the tanks. The capsules represent about a third of the total radioactivity on the Hanford site. While they are currently in a safe configuration, WESIF is an aging facility. Transferring them to dry storage would eliminate the possibility of a release of radioactive material in the unlikely event of a major earthquake that might result in the loss of pool storage water and subsequent overheating and breach of the capsules. Teams of well-trained personnel will accomplish this work safely and compliantly, benefiting from the lessons learned and proficiencies gained from training with the equipment at a full-scale non-radiological mock-up. To begin the removal process, workers on a catwalk will use long-reach pole tools to access the capsules that are stored under 13 feet of water, which provides adequate radiation shielding for the workers. Workers will retrieve the capsule and move it to the transfer chute connecting to the hot cell or G cell. From outside G cell, workers will use manipulator arms to bring the capsule near a shielded window to inspect the capsule for damage. They will also verify the capsule's identity to ensure the correct capsules are loaded in such a way to comply with the capsule storage thermal analysis. If operators find a damaged capsule, they will place it in a larger overpack capsule. Then, workers using the manipulator arms and a special insertion tool will place the capsule into a universal capsule sleeve, or UCS. The UCS can hold up to six capsules. Once the UCS is full, the air inside will be displaced with helium, which helps dissipate the heat from the capsules. Following a successful leak test, the UCS is ready for transfer to the truck port. Using cameras, workers will guide a grapple over the UCS, hoist it out of G-cell and into the shielded dry transfer system, or DTS. The DTS is a large shielded cask that will transfer the UCS from G-cell into the west of Canyon to the truck port using a 15-ton crane. In the truck port is an 11 foot tall, 10 foot diameter cask shielded with reinforced concrete. In the cask is a storage container capable of holding up to 22 universal capsule sleeves. A robotic welder will seal the lid of the inner storage container. The air will be removed and then the container will be filled with helium to aid in keeping the capsules cool. Once the helium is in place, a second outer lid will be placed on the storage container and welded in place. Once the loading process is complete, workers will open the truck port roll-up door and remove the cask. The equipment used to transport the cask has been repurposed from a previous DOE project, avoiding millions of dollars of cost. The vertical cask transporter, or VCT, a specially designed hydraulic lift unit is used to lift the cask. The tug will tow the VCT and cask to the capsule storage area. 
a 90 foot by 90 foot secure outdoor storage pad located approximately one quarter mile from Wessif. The cask will be placed on the pad and will be connected to a temperature monitoring system. The cask will be placed in one of the 25 locations on the pad. Once the final capsule has been retrieved and the final cask has been placed onto the storage pad, Wessif can be prepared for demolition. These cesium and strontium capsules will remain in a safe and passive condition until a permanent storage location is available. Can you change the oh, audio? The audio? Oh, sounds to be fine. That was just sharing the computer audio. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of an overview of the process. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that process, but uh, if not, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and move on to the next part of it. I'm going to give you kind of a status on where we're at with the project. So for the W135 project, it kind of is broken up into four different sub projects. So the first one is the uh, waste encapsulated storage facility modification project. So that is really modifying the facility and getting it ready to be able to install and then operate the equipment. That things like uh, they're adding new HVAC system, adding new camera systems, air temperature monitoring systems, and uh, you know all the uh, conduit and the tubing that supports uh, the electrical work for um, you know for the transfer equipment and for operating the pack fill equipment things like that. So um, second uh, sub project is the capsule storage area. Again, that's that that storage pad that that you saw where the uh, VC or the concrete cast will be, will be stored. And that includes, you know, that road, road improvement and all the utilities, the fencing, the lighting, things like that. We have the cast storage system. Uh, that's actually the fabrication of the transfer equipment as well as um, the fabrication of the vertical concrete cask and all the components that go within it. Um, and then there's the, uh, the mock-up uh, at the massive facility, which are the material and storage facility, again, which is a mock-up of three different areas that we'll be using at Wetson. That. So um, for the uh, West of Mod uh, part of it, um, if I, if I, we started uh, construction back in April of 2021. I think the last time I, I kind of reported back to Hanford on, or to the HAB here on the, on the, on the status we were at was back in February of 2022. At that time, we were just about done with all the exterior work and then we're starting to work on the interior of the building. So that's kind of where we've been focusing. The picture on the left, that's actually the truck port. Um, I know that doesn't look like a lot, but uh, there's been quite a bit of work that's been done in here. Uh, when the vertical concrete cast, as I said, is 11 feet tall and 10 feet in, in diameter, and when we move it into the into the truck port, there's only a few inches of clearance on either side of the walls there. So, um, so there was a lot of work to move a lot of the piping that you see on, on the left and to the right to bring that in closer to the walls. Um, here it is. Uh, right here, there's these three uh, units here and three on this side. That's part of the new HVAC system that we installed. Again, that'll help maintain the uh, temperature in that area down to 85 degrees or less. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, the, the fire suppression system was modified. Um, you can see this duct work here on the top. It actually comes down the side of this wall here, which you can't see, but that had to be modified, brought in closer again to, to, bring, to allow room to move the, the vertical concrete cast in. And probably the biggest is, is to this flooring here. Now, you may not notice it, but um, we had to actually cut the floor away from the wall uh, because the casts themselves fully loaded weigh about 169,000 pounds. So we didn't want to put that stress on the wall. So we cut the flooring away from the wall and then increased the height of the floor here by 10 inches. And so we added a lot of rebar and concrete to be able to uh, make sure that that floor can support the weight of, of, the, of the casts. On to the right here, this is looking inside inside G cell. This is the uh, the west uh, yeah, the west wall. And again, just kind of highlight all the tubing and piping that we had to put in there. Uh, this is uh, again tubing that supports the air compression system that will operate a lot of the equipment. Again, so you can see this tubing here is for the uh, again the evacuation and, and helium backfill system. Um, uh, this here, up here, you can barely see it, but that is a, a new uh, again. Uh, HVAC system again to help help keep that area cool during operation. 
we installed new cameras. There's one here as well as on the other side of, of the of the uh, of the room. Those are um, radiation hardened cameras that were installed again to support um, you know, future operations here. Again, a few other. This is in the uh, the picture on the left is in the service gallery. That's capital. Those uh, capsule sleeves until uh, um, basically in the service gallery is the backside of G cell. So there's a door that opens up and then allows us access to G cell where we can then move the universal capsule sleeves and load them into the up ender um, as needed. And then the, uh, the picture on the right is the new chiller unit again in the service gallery. Again, that supports the, uh, the HVAC system in the uh, in, in, in G cell. Um, uh, again, there's still a lot of pictures of a lot of activity of work that has been done to date, right? So uh, the picture on the left is the ambient temperature monitoring panel. As I said, there's there's resistant uh, temperature detectors that were installed in three different areas that will be operating, and so that's connected to this um, monitoring panel. So we can monitor the temperatures in those areas. Uh, again, pictures on the right just shows again that um, the the, uh, the HVAC system that will be used to uh, support. Uh, um, keeping the area in the truck port and the uh, um, in the canyon pool. Air handling units here, a lot of piping. So again, a lot of work has been done. We are uh, pretty much close to finishing the West of Mod um, construction activities. We were hoping to be done here at the end of July, uh, June, but it looks like a little bit of some activities are pushing in July. We'll have all the construction acceptance testing done, and we're hoping to then start uh, turn that whole um, construction efforts over to operations in August so that they can then start uh, working to install the production equipment or transfer equipment. Uh, the capsule storage area, really not, not much to report, uh, new to report here. I think last time I reported most of the construction efforts been done. The only thing we hadn't completed was there's some, some wiring that we had to, uh, to do from the pad here over to the temperature monitoring a station that's you can see it right here on this better picture a little bit better um, that work was done in, in october the facility has been transferred over to operations um, in december um, and so uh, right now they're getting ready to do their uh, operational readiness activities in in the next fiscal year uh, i did add this picture here to the left it's uh, so those are the actual vertical concrete caps they have all been uh, fabricated there was 19 of them. Uh, one of them is within Massive, which we'll show, show a picture of earlier. The other 18 are currently being stored um, at the CSA. This is a, a picture of ours. They're actually fabricated here in, uh, or, or assembled here at the Highline facility. That work was done in October, and but we just moved them in March to, to the actual Stanford site. It's kind of hard to see from the picture, but there's four vents along the bottom and four vents along the top. And you, I don't know, you kind of see some of the conduit here. Again, we have resistant temperature detectors on each of the vents on the top. Again, to we'll monitor the temperature of those during, um, uh, during storage. So for the uh, cast storage system, um, again, last February, I think when I, when I talked to you guys, uh, most of the test, or, the test articles for the transfer equipment were already fabricated. They were just starting doing the factory acceptance testing. Um, and so uh, since then, they've done completed all the factory acceptance testing on the transfer test article transfer equipment. They completed the integration test that they did to make sure that the, art, that the equipment functioned together as it should. Uh, based on that, there was some lessons learned and some operational changes that were made. But uh, at that point, then they went ahead and started fabrication of the production equipment. Um, this here is a picture of actually the, the test equipment that's already been installed at NASA. Uh, so this is the, the upender here. Uh, again, uh, the universal capsule sleeve uh, is in this horizontal position here, and that's how it's loaded. Uh, once it's loaded, then it uh, basically flips to a, a, to a vertical position, uh, which is then the, the lid is then put on and then um, it's completed. This here is the recovery shield assembly. Um, usually this is rotated 90 degrees in this direction, but uh, uh, we can rotate that so that allows people to get access into the G cell area. Um, this is just in case if uh, we're loading uh, uh, capsules in here and something happens to the, uh, the upender and we need to get in that uh, area to, to fix it, uh, we can slide this universal capsule into this uh, shielded assembly here 
and it provides the shielding needed that uh, to allow people to get into the, the into the uh, G cell and do the repairs. And this is just another picture of it that um, from the from the window looking in. Uh, so as I said, they they they've already started fabricating the production equipment. In fact, uh, last month all the production equipment, uh, all the production equipment has been fabricated. Last month they finished the factory acceptance testing on each of the equipment. So, so we're we're in pretty good shape. This here is actually the uh, uh, automatic weld system, um, and this here is the gantry that the automatic weld system will be attached to the slides over the the top of the uh, the truck port area that slides away to allow for loading. Um, the uh, the gantry here was actually fabricated by a company uh, called LSI out of Chicago. And then, of course, the uh, uh, automatic weld system was fabricated uh, by Li Liberty, a company called Liberty up in Canada. And so this actual equipment is in Canada right now. The testing, again, has been completed. And so that right now we're finishing up all the paperwork, and they're getting ready to disassemble that, package it up, and then ship it to Wesson, which we hope to get here in, uh, in August. Um, the picture on the right. That is actually a transportable storage container uh, that's fabricated in by Hitachi Zoza in Japan. <clears throat> so this is actually a picture of the of the one that will be used at um, at the mock-up. Uh, this is here them wrapping it up and getting it ready to ship. It was actually placed on a ship uh, two weeks ago, and it takes it. So it's right now somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. It'll get uh, it'll take about six weeks. It gets to uh, to, to the states. At which point, then this will actually be uh, delivered to a company called AB and W, ABW, and uh, it's on the uh, west side uh, near, uh, I think it's Arlington, Washington. And so they're going to take it and they're going to have, they're going to do a cold spray on the welds, basically spray like a nickel nickel alloy on the welds. That'll kind of help for uh, to, re to help the uh, help reduce the corrosion. Um, just to kind of point out this basket here, here this is the number of the 11 chambers that the universal capsule sleeves will be loaded into. Okay, so this here is the shielded index assembly. Again, this is uh, last month they completed the factory acceptance on this. This again goes since in, on top of the vertical concrete cast and this rotates around uh, to line up with the 11 uh, chambers that are in the tent. Uh, in the uh, transportable storage container. Um, and then this here is the G gate. Uh, again, the, the dry transfer system, which I'll show a picture of, it connects to, to these gates here, right? That's how you uh, basically, uh, uh, how we move the capsules and load them, uh, or either you move them out of the G cell or, or again, uh, load them into the vertical concrete casks. Um, so for the this is the full scale mock up at, at Massive. Um, uh, this is a picture of the control panels that are, are being worked on here. Again, actually the uh, the, the mock up is complete. All the equipment has been installed and they energized about two weeks ago and they're running through a series of tests now to make sure everything's functioning as it should. Um, here's a picture of the dry transfer system. Again, this is the test articles on their app at, at Massive. Um, and this is your the G cell gate. You can see where it's butt up against. Um, this is a, a picture of the uh, G cell evacuation and helium backfill system. And then this is the actual automatic weld system that was installed back in uh, in November, I think, last year. And it's been uh, commissioned, and they're already starting to do testing on that as well, as well or testing and, and do training on that over at Massive. Again, uh, some of the pictures. This is the vertical con number the 19 vertical concrete cast. Uh, it's here being loaded into the, the, the truck port mock-up. Uh, here it is inside the truck port mock-up with the, uh, the shield ring. And uh, this is just a picture of the, uh, the air pallet, which will be used to move the vertical, con vertical concrete cast in and out of the truck port. Uh, so the summary, I guess. Uh, quick, I'll just kind of highlight again, um, kind of what we've accomplished and or what we expect to have accomplished by the end of this fiscal year and what will be going into the next fiscal year. So uh, again, for this fiscal year, we've completed all the installation of the test transfer equipment at the, at the mock-up facility. We've energized it and we're now doing the testing in there. Um, the uh, um, WESF modification 
um, construction activities will be completed this year. We will start seeing the, uh, the actual production transfer equipment coming in and start installing that by the end of this fiscal year. So moving into the FY24, basically we'll uh, continue to uh, finalize procedures, uh, hire, train, uh, get people proficient uh, at the operation uh, using the mock-up. Um, and then of course, over at, at WESIF, uh, we'll continue to, we'll, we'll, com we'll basically install all the equipment and do all the testing and, and get that completed by the end of FY24. And that'll set us up then to start doing all, to, to do all the readiness activity needed to start operation in 2025. But I know right now we do have a TPA milestone that says we will complete uh, all the transfer activities by August of 2025 that will be missed. I think I discussed that at the last half meeting as well, and I've discussed it with Ecology. We have kind of held off on negotiating a new date because there's some uncertainty on the timing for how, how long it will take to load a, a cask. Originally, our assumption was that it's about a month uh, for each cask. And of course, with 18 casks, that will be about a year and a half's worth of work. As we're going through and, and developing the procedures and looking at what maintenance activities may need to be done between each loading of the cask, um, we look like it might be more like a, a, a month and a half to load each, each cast, so that extends that period to about a 27 month uh, operation. Um, so we figure uh, as, as we get the mock-up up and going, as we start running through the process and procedures, we'll have a better idea of what that timing will look like and then be able to negotiate much, uh, a more realistic uh, milestone date. Um, so I think that's, that's all I have. Any, any questions? Let's check in with ecology before we go to questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have a, a ton to, to cover, but uh, we were able to go tour NASA about a month ago, um, take a look at the mock up. Uh, at that point, it wasn't completely together, but it was very close. Um, uh, so I guess it's just a general perspective. Um, we're aware about the, the deadline and the fact that it's just going to be missed. Um, not an ideal situation there, but looking at the progress that's been made, uh, all of the significant equipment has been um, at least, you know, the mock-up version purchased, moved in. Um, so from my own perspective, I think there has been a, a pretty significant um, uh, drive to get this done. Um, supply chain issues, you know, have been documented over the last few years, so it's, I guess, not entirely unexpected, but um, things do seem to be finally coming together. Um, didn't see, you know, anything too concerning at NASA, the way it was set up. Um, at that point, there are a few things still being worked out, like you know, just tools and, you know, how do we actually do this, which I think further reinforces that it should be done um, a little carefully and, and really considered over the next year, uh, training operators and getting this final design going. So I, I think that um, I probably stayed up for it. I think that it's a, a good thing that we're uh, looking at reconsidering that milestone and deciding um, how long these transfers will really take. Um, some of the last details are um, you know, going to be important just from an overall, you know, functional and um, processing standpoint. So um, personally, I'm more concerned with that than the, the safety of less of over the next two years. Um, I think WSF will continue to be um, safe until it can be retired. So um, that's maybe a little more than I wanted to say there, but um, if there are any specific questions, um, <coughs> definitely I'm, I'm very willing to, to talk to you. So Gary, can Gary will know the details a lot. <laughs> Better than I will. We do have questions. We've got a couple of folks online with us with questions about the casks, and then I've got Ryan. So, Rose, kick it off, and then we'll go to Simone. Rose? Yeah, thank you, Ruth. 
Um, yeah, I am kind of curious. Um, this looks uh, very familiar to what I've seen out at the West Valley site as far as the way the casts are put out in the open on this concrete slab. Um, and I'm just, but I'm kind of cu uh, curious. Uh, well, first of all, it looks like it was kind of modeled after that to some extent. Um, but then the other question that I had is, um, how what was the lifespan of these casts? You're you're saying for you know you you think that you know that it's going to be safe for the life of the project. What what is that life? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they actually are a, a basically a modified. Uh, uh, cast that's used for spent nuclear fuel had to be modified because ours generate a lot more heat than, than, the, than the spent nuclear fuel does. So, um, yeah, they're very similar. Uh, the design life, uh, uh, design for the cast were, were uh, I, I think their design life was out to 300 years, what they've been designed to. Uh, and our nuclear safety documents, I think we only take credit for 40 years. And so we do have an aging management program that we'll be utilizing to kind of help defend uh, extending that from a nuclear safety standpoint. But uh, but again, the, the design uh, and actually NAC, the same company that, that designed all the ones that they use at West Valley as well, um, are designed these out to, three, to, be, to, to meet a, a 300 year design life. Okay, so then that being said, then what kind of um, monitoring program is going to be set in place? How often will this be monitored to make sure that they are, and, and I guess, what, I, don't, I don't know if there's a way of being able to um, ascertain the, um, uh, I guess, the stability of the cask itself and, and, and the inner workings of it, like in the tanks, you know, they can stick cameras down there and they kind of know what's going on or they can tell by pressure or, you know, loss. What, do you have some kind of a safety, um, some safety elements in there to make sure that they are performing as designed? Yeah, so like, as I mentioned, there's actually an aging, an aging management program that we're um, implementing as part of this. And we've been working uh, with uh, PNL and some other labs, as well as with NAC and some other companies that, that store, you know, these type of tasks, at, you know, for spent nuclear fuel. And so we will have a, a, a basically that 19th uh, vertical concrete cast that's currently being used at massive that will actually be stored on the operational pad and we have basically heating elements that will add in there to simulate um, uh, the capsules, right? And so we'll be able to monitor that and periodically go in and see if there's been any impact to that cast, because um, it would be very, you know, because if we see something there, then, then potentially could we see something over at the, uh, you know, on, on other, other, other 918 casts. Um, and then of course we have our temperature monitoring system that will, uh, continue to monitor again inspections to look at if there's any cracks or anything in the in the um, um, in the uh, in the concrete right because that's where you're probably going to see your first signs of wear because a lot of this is all stainless steel uh, you know aluminum uh, type material that has are pretty pretty robust uh, material so okay thank you all right. Simone is online and she had a, a different question around casts. Simone, are you still with us? Hi, yeah. I was just wondering, so uh, the casts outside on the like concrete pad, are they covered? Is there a cover over them? I couldn't quite tell from the photo. Yeah, no, they're not they're not covered. Nope. Are they gonna be are they going to be covered or are they just gonna be left? uncovered no they'll just be, be left out well i mean they'll, they'll be out in the, in the open so uh, again the, the the cast design uh, you know it's pretty robust design there's actually uh there's there's kind of like a, a russian nesting doll right where you have the universal capsules are inside the transportable storage container uh, that container has two lids it has an inner lid and an outer lid that are all welded on and then that fits within the vcc and um, I don't know if we can go back to the picture, but uh, if you look at the, the pictures of ECC on the top, there's a, a metal plate. Um, that's really kind of a, a cover that protects the, uh, uh, the transportable storage container that's inside um, from, the, from the elements. Um, but, but again, it's designed to be outside. Again, it, we, we have that passive air cooling system that, that, that uh, requires it to be kind of out in the open. So. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Uh, you go back to Phil and Laura, right there. And so you can see there's there's a plate on top of the VCC. That's actually a, a cover plate that's just kind of help protect it from the elements because the actual uh, transportal source container that actually is our confinement boundary for the capsules is actually inside that. So when you say airflow control, when it's 120 degrees repetitively day after day, is that no yep, yep. So of course, the whenever they do the thermal calculations for any of this, it's always very um, uh, conservative, and so they assume like you know it's 120. Uh, I don't remember the exact temperature, but that, you know, that's conservative for next year, but probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, they assume it's 100 degrees outside day and night for a longer period of time, right? So they're pretty conservative with the calculations. Yeah. <clears throat> Direct missile hit and earthquake. That's all. That's all. That's all part of the design right here. Right? Yeah. I don't know if the missiles strike the earthquake. Well. Ryan. Yeah, I can answer my question. I was going to ask about um, how long it would take to transfer everything, but you, you said that about a month, a month and a half for each one. So. Three, Twenty-seven months total is what you were projected. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Twenty-seven months. It was a little over two-year operation. Right. So turn 2030, we should be all done with this. Demolition, what's the scar on it? But I don't know about demolition. My project is just getting them out. And then after that, there will be an effort to, I think, put the facility in some kind of cold and dark configuration. And I don't think they actually plan to, to demolish it until they do be planned. I think that's all going to be one. I, I believe that's the plan. So, yeah. Provis, you have a non tech removal action to come through before that happens, too. So. Mia. Um, I have a variety of questions. Can you clarify? Um, you said, I think you said next year, 2024, that you'll start loading the capsules. Is that correct? No, in 2024, again, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be basically doing all the training in, in, in the mock up, and we'll be installing the transfer equipment at WESA and then doing a pre operational acceptance testing, which should be done by the end of that fiscal year. That then sets us up to do the operational readiness activities in 2025. Okay. And so we have to go through our um, readiness activities. Uh, you know, this contractor does theirs, and then DOE will do our, do, do our assessment to make sure the contractor is ready to start operating before we give them the green light. And so uh, right now we're looking at July of 2025 would be about the time we start operation. Okay, thank you. Um, and the mock up. At the maintenance and storage facility, is that on site or is that like in around Richland? Zone? That's over by, I don't know if you're familiar with the FFPFS facility. Yeah. Um, it's, it's over in, in that area. So it's not on the Hanford site, it's in the, it's close by uh, Central Rock. Is that something we could tour at yeah. some point? Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. That, that would be good. great. I'm going to get on my list. Lindsay, be on track. <laughs> And then my other question is about, um, can you share more information about the fire suppression system? You're talking about modification. Oh, yeah. So in the way the uh, in the fire suppression system in the truck port, just again, the piping was in a way that didn't allow for us to move the vertical concrete. Yeah, so we just had to modify the piping in there. Um, you know, the, um, yeah, and kind of just move things around. It wasn't really a significant uh, change to to the design, just uh, just some minor changes to to a couple of the areas. Okay, thank you. All right, I've got Rose and then Tom. Rose, what's on your mind? Well, I'm not trying to be sarcastic or anything, so just you know, bear with me here. But you know, I see your your I I, I kind of see this picture of these casks sitting out there and. Given our troubled times, I see it as a target. I, I'm sorry. I, somebody else said missile. I didn't. But now that they said yeah. it, it made me think of it. That I mean, without any kind of camouflage or, or anything like that, I just I don't know. I I, I I like I say I see that pad as a as a big nice target with a big red dot on it. You know, because that's that's some bad stuff that we would not certainly would not want you know to get hit but anyway i just had to say that because you guys are not planning on camouflaging it in any way i mean i i has there been any talk at all about how you could maybe camouflage that pad with all of that stuff on there or no not, not that i'm aware of no okay all righty well 
probably more to come on that as the years pass. Huh? <laughs> Wouldn't the safety analysis have, I know that they do airplane impact. Yeah, they do airplane. I don't know if they've done a missile mm -hmm. attack. I know they, they do an airplane. If an airplane was to crash into them and they're, they're secure, but. Uh, um, so the, the reactor cores for the su nuclear submarines that are stored in open pits on the site were left open so that the surveillance, you know, satellites from the former Soviet Union could verify that they were still in place. And I wonder if these would also be subject to surveillance. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think that surveillance is done as part of a treaty, and these are obviously our, our uh, uh, reactor compartments, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But they're pretty cool. I think that's a military thing with the submarines. I think that's kind of a military thing, isn't it? Yeah, and this is legacy military stuff too, right? Um, no, those, I think, I know this is, uh, I mean, these are just cesium and strontium that was, you know, uh, separated out from the tanks. And then, of course, um, actually some of this material was sent off site to be used at commercial facilities for a radiation source. Um, um, and so, in fact, there's there's been discussions about maybe using other sending some of the strontium off off site to be used at, as, a, as a product product, make batteries for um, RTGs or, or you know, something that helps out with the, some of the space programs for DOD. So it may be repurposed at yep. some point. Yep. Tom? Yeah, so you said there were a couple of inches of clearance in the truck bay. What type of mobility does the transportation system have, you know, in pitch and yaw, and, or is it just? Front and back, and then you have to like it's, sort of, it's really just front and back. But I think um, so. You really got to get lined up perfectly. Yeah, there's the there's time. there's going to be some guard rolls at that at uh, air pallets. Actually, pretty neat because yeah, you can push it in, and then you can actually move it to the left or right. And mm. of course, this thing weighs 169,000 pounds, and um, yeah, you can move it with ease, right? I mean, it's like just a big uh, um, big air pallet, right? Like, mm -hmm. One of the ice hockey uh, ice. Uh, I saw detail. Air hockey table. Air hockey table. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, how that's it? Yeah. Once you get it going, though, it's like, and then try to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> and then, what type of contingency is there? Should one of these containers have a problem down the road, um, we will have the one extra that you're going to be testing that. If there's a problem, it will also probably have the problem. So we've seen how long the lead time is to get a replacement of these um, with supply chain issues and when they're producing them at sort of scale. Um, is there backup to the backup, I guess? Uh, well, I'd say, I guess if, if something was to happen and, and we had an issue with one of the BCCs and we would probably have to use the, the 19th one, um, and then we would probably fabricate another for the ADF. And, and there may be some delay there, but uh, you know, for the aging management program, right, um, you know, you would need it right away. Thanks. Dan, online. Uh, thank you. Uh, Hanford Chavez did an interesting uh, program the other day uh, on the interim storage and there was a significant uh, infrared uh, a signal from interim storage of spent fuel is there is, and i assume there'll be a significant infrared uh, signal from these uh, these uh, casts also will that be detectable from outer space how long will that last and is there uh, any thought given to shielding it uh, shielding it so that the infrared signal is is visible in the air yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I, I would imagine they would be visible. Um, the, you know, the plan right now is, is just for storage. Obviously, uh, with the, we haven't made a decision on, on where we'll position these things yet. And so right now they plan to be stored, uh, you know, long-term storage on this on this interim storage pad. Um, I think the half-life for, for uh, strontium and cesium is roughly around 30 years. Um, and so, uh, you know, over time, they'll they'll slowly decay, and, and then they won't have, I guess, that heat. Uh, um, they won't be releasing as much heat. So, um, 
Thank you. Hope that answers your question. I don't, I don't know if I can answer your question, but yeah. Did you say where the path located on site? I'm sure you did. But I... Yeah, I think there was a picture yeah. shows that shows it. It's uh, it's in between. I don't know if you're familiar it's with the west. The, it's on the 200 east area, and it's in between west of and where the CSB, the Canada, the Canada Cancer Storage Building is. <coughs> Yeah. yeah. We saw the slab on our bus tour. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the central. Yeah, central planning for two hundred and So we've got like fourteen people online and a dozen of us in the room. Um, I notice we've got one person on the phone. Do you want to jump in with a question or comment? Are there other questions, comments from anyone? Um, so this is a topic that is of great interest to uh, folks in the Tri-Cities and outside the Tri-Cities. Um, when do you think would be an appropriate time to come back and uh, talk to us again? Um, well, I, I would say I think I've been coming over a year just to kind of clean updates. So okay. you know, a year from now, I would like to be more than happy to, to Provide another update, show where we're at. Uh, like I said, by the end of, as I mentioned before, by the end of next uh, fiscal year, uh, we should be uh, have a lot of training done and, and everything installed at, 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 at Wesso. So maybe a, maybe a spring tour of Massa. Yep. <laughs> Got your request. I was going to say, Mia's eyes are sparkling. But then everything We've should be installed and we should be doing our testing. Yeah. Okay. Anyone with last minute questions? Yeah. That was great. Thank you very yeah, much. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see progress being made. Yeah. It's, it's fun being part of the project. Uh, yeah, I think we made a lot of progress. And it's, it's good to see all that equipment just, working. And, how long have you been in task in front of that? So I've been working on this project for a little over three years now. Yeah, yeah I got it just before they started doing uh, uh, construction and fabrication. So, so most of the design and, and planning had been done. So I kind of got in as they started working, doing the work. <laughs> That's That's before, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's always good to hear from you. Um, Thank you. So we are uh, 15 minutes ahead of schedule. I, I don't know why this keeps on happening. Um, <laughs> we're going, let's let's take one last break for the day, and then uh, we'll we'll plow through the uh, open. Well, we'll plow through the open forum. We'll have the open forum <laughs> and get through the committee business. Uh, so maybe we can get up a little bit early so we can make it over to the public comment section of the uh, mass. Okay. So uh, three o'clock. Three o'clock. Thank you. Keep going. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we had an agency request for uh, a quick announcement. So we'll start that and then we'll jump into open forum. I'll kick it over to Matt actually. So we had an upcoming comment period. Not the, we don't have the exact dates yet, but uh, since Matt was around and, and he's the lead on it, I thought we'd just share a little bit of information. Yeah, uh, so tentatively we're looking at starting a comment period for a thermal oxidation system on tank BY-108 on June 19th. Um, commonly this has been called Nucon, which is actually the company producing it. Uh, for uh, people who have been following Hanford for a while, this is kind of a uh, the next step in um, the tank vapor lawsuit that uh, approximately 2014, 2015, I think was uh, when um, started uh, gaining attention. Um, there was a settlement between Ecology and several local interest groups and DOE 
uh, to look at um, potential treatment options for vapors coming off the storage tanks. Um, there have been several small scale tests so far, and this is the, the next step, trying to scale it up and actually put it on a tank and, and see if they can reduce some of the um, chemicals of potential concern for, for worker exposure. So um, comment period should be starting within the next few weeks. Um, it'll just be on the approval order itself, which will allow them to install it. And then once there's data uh, for um, it's a scheduled four month test, um, then kind of a decision will be made how to proceed. But um, to bring some awareness because there have been um, interest in the past. So is this a 30 day comment period? Okay. It, it'll be a, a full comment period. Um, yes. Okay. And, and the drafts will be available um, for review. So the draft permit and technical support document. Yeah, I mean, I bet tanks would be interested in hearing that again. Yeah, to yeah I, I, I took a few notes and I'll touch base with Matt and I can bring it up. I have a question. Um, sure. Thank you so much for sharing this. Can you repeat the tank that you're doing the testing on? BY108. BY108. Correct. Okay, thank you. It's actually also a radio station in Orlando. <laughs> 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 Where your country is. And you said thermal oxidation there's some system. System, okay. And Nucon is the common name that's being used for it. Okay. But, um, it's a little bit of an unusual thermal oxidizer. Uh, it's actually they're just an external combustion, more like a furnace, essentially. But um, uh, DOE and WRPS think that this design might be a little more effective for some of the more resistant chemicals. Yeah. And um, yeah. thank you. And this is going to be an ecology hosted one, right? So we're the, we're the lead on it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ecology will be answering, uh, responding to public comments. Okay. Just make sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we'll move into open forum. Um, if, if this is your first rap party, uh, open forum is um, a time to talk about anything and everything uh, Hanford or Hanford adjacent. Uh, there is no structure other than uh, we have a time limit. And uh, if there's too much silence, we'll move on. Uh, but yeah, anybody have anything to talk about, bros? Yeah, um, I'm just kind of going back to earlier discussions, and I, I think it was Jan, but I can't Jan, remember, I can't remember. Um, who had said something about in reference to um, maybe we need to look at our meeting schedule and whatnot in order to be able to accommodate comments, um, especially with some larger documents coming in um, and advice that we are going to want to put in on some of those documents and, and whatnot. Um, it's, you know, if DOE kind of keeps with the schedule that they are looking at, uh, which I have no, uh, I, I don't have real st um, strong feelings that they're going to keep that, uh, <laughs> that schedule, but if, if they are, then it's going to be a really heavy lift for this group um, to go through uh, for some of that stuff. And so, uh, and, and, and she had mentioned that maybe we might want to look at potentially scheduling uh, other meetings. And, and I just, I kind of wanted to bring that back up again, because I really think that there was a lot of merit to what she said um, with regards to, um, you know, being able to meet enough where we can handle um, some of these documents. And I, I think our meeting schedule really should depend more on the workload rather than just trying to keep to some artificial schedule um, and so I'd, I'd really like to kind of maybe get some more thoughts on that or, or what have you, but I just really support that idea of, of adding some meetings. You know, if we if we end up not needing the meetings, we can always cancel them. It's not a big deal. But to maybe look at getting some dates on a calendar in case we do need those as we get closer to some of those documents might not be a bad idea, especially with everybody's schedules and such. Um, booking up um, to just be able to have some placeholders might not be a bad idea. Anyway, just my thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, the uh, the leadership workshop, uh, which is happening on Thursday, is going to be our time to um, 
propose those, those additional meetings, and I will definitely uh, bring that message. Uh, not that everyone uh, can't hear it now, but um, at the leadership workshop, we'll also make sure that that is spoken. Um, also, any other topics I sent around, um, sort of not the wrap, the CARMS uh, topic list that the agencies presented. Um, I added a couple to what I think should be on there as well. So maybe now would be a good time if anyone sees anything else on the, that list that was in an email a couple days ago, a week ago, um, you know, chime in and we can get that on, on record as well. Um, so I have what I need uh, on Thursday. So we can sort of merge open forum and work plan sort of brainstorming. Raise that as a question that we have to. How? How? No. Um, so, <laughs> what do uh, what do you want this committee to talk about next year um, that isn't on the list that was circulated last week? Is this a committee next year? What's going on in the fall? So, most of the stuff that RAP talks about is morphing over to CARB. Uh, so cleanup and risk mitigation. So uh, it's not one to one, but it's ammo. It's an ammo. I, uh, Stephen, I think we were talking about what the time frame is of talking about next year whether it's calendar year or uh, fiscal year, is that what you're? Well, I, there was talk of this fall was we were going to realign the, right. the new upset the committee's the upset card year, first, yeah, and everything's right. going to change. Yeah, so, so we're talking about what the committee that inherited, that inherits the scope of this committee, we'll be talking about from October of this year through September of next year. So we've already we've already talked about uh, the two proposed plans potentially. We talked about Rev Nine, which is going to be a little bit of here, a little bit of there, and a little bit over there. Um, so that might be a a work group rather than a committee discussion. Um, we talked about having West back in uh, summer. Um, what else is on the work time? Uh, oh, the P-Pause. Yeah. P-Pause is going to be interesting. That's, um, Say that in English. Uh, yeah. I can't. That's the English uh, version of it. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a chemist. Uh, pair, um, pair and polyfluoral alkyl substances. I see. You did it just fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's an emergent contaminant. EPA is starting to think about regulating it in drinking water. Um, and uh, DOE has committed to um, assessing all of its sites for its use. So uh, I think it's a desktop study right now. Uh, but yeah, that, that's going to be a fun one. An emerging contaminant. So they decided, hey, I know, let's make this other thing. Is that what's really coming up? It's a forever chemical. Uh -huh. um, so it is um, nonstick coating. It's fireproofing. Oh, it's that's firefighting right. foam. And it's a long chain polymer that doesn't break down. Not really. Yeah. yeah. You might see this in the news in the uh, uh, Yakima area at the Yakima Training Center where the, that's where they're doing all the firefighting drills and they've got all the chemicals in the ground. And now a bunch of, of groundwater and stuff and seal is contaminated and some people can't get their water over there because of it. I think it's in the water up at um, the Air Force Base is looking on too. Yeah. Yeah. Your medical rate. Yeah, and the college did issue a penalty to the Yakima Training Center a couple of months ago on that issue. When I was in New England, they were shutting down municipal water districts and having to drill new wells in different aquifers because the whole town's water was just not very good. And they have been drinking it they have, since the 40s. And these things are just now being tested, but it's a really expensive test. And it's a really hard test to run because it's in everything. So you have to wear like unwashed organic clothes and only write with a certain type of pen because the protection limits are so low. Um, 
just writing on the bag with the sharpie is going to contaminate the sample. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. So is it a hammer? Oh, I, I can't see that. <laughs> That, we'll, we'll, place to do a testing. We'll, we'll be talking. We'll be talking, and, we'll be talking about it next year for sure. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> I um, don't know the answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so then so also. I look your way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so then we have our periodically appearing uh, presentations on uh, the groundwater monitoring and pump and treat and uh, investigations and uh, 344 building. Um, we do, or is that, what, is that waste, or is that? This is, this is the. 324 is this one. Mm -hmm. what, what are the new hot indexes? Did I hear it's a lot worse than it used to be? I don't know. We'll talk about it next year. <laughs> um, and then, uh, I don't have my computer up for running, but yeah, like the list that I have. Yeah. And oh, Tom. Yeah. yeah. One other thing to think about is if things don't come forward to the leadership workshop and they become emerging throughout the year, then it's something that the committee can propose be added to the work plan at a later date. Yeah, it, it is a living document. Yes, so it's not like an all or nothing come Thursday. But if there's anything like on your mind that you're interested in either getting into detail on or just I don't know enough about this and I want to, um, that's that's what we're here for, right? Um, okay, so if you want your well, and it's not necessarily you just I am interested. I. It's my, what my, is your constituency? Right, my, my organization, and I, I speak royally. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then let's see. We already talked about WESIF. Um, oh, something else that I guess this is a more of an open forum topic that is also worth planning. Um, a couple months ago. Uh, there was a tour at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, they're doing amazing science, amazing science on um, sequestering contaminants in, in the deep bayos. So injecting stuff and then taking contaminants that would normally go to groundwater and turning them into minerals so they don't go to groundwater. Um, they have a feasibility study for the deep bayos zone um, operable unit that's due to DOE in September. Um, so they said uh, they're not interested in presenting to us um, in September because they're going to be working 18 hour days to get that report done. But um, starting in October, they might have a little bit of time and a nice glossy report that they can talk to. Um, and they're absolutely interested in bringing the science that they're doing um, to us and talking about. Um, treatment options for soils that are like 150 to 100 to 200 feet down that you can't get to otherwise. So really cool stuff, and they're doing it in a meticulous, repeatable like chalice of, of science that's happening, and it's it's amazing. And um, the presentation that that uh, that we got to see was um, it was understandable. Um, they'll probably need to uh, define a little more acronyms and take some time with some of the stuff they're talking through. But um, I asked them if they'd be willing to talk to this committee, and they absolutely want to do that. So, um, nominated for the Holy Grail Award, is that what you're saying? That's, that's what I'm saying. There's good science happening just down the street right. here. Um, and it's actually right next to the building that they're doing the testing in, is right next to the 324 building. Um, so, it's, yeah, you can see it from there. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Dan's got a Dan. So uh, Yes, thank you. The initials escaped me now, but I think it was, I, I can't remember. Now. They, we, they've taken down one reprocessing plant, one plutonium reprocessing plant, and they had some fugitive the radionuclides come out of that process. They did a, a, a lessons learned thing on it. So I'm wondering if we can get a report on the lessons learned being applied to the planning of taking down the next uh, reprocessing plant. Is that the PFP? The initial... uh, yeah, the PFP. Uh, the PFP is the next one, or the PFP is the one that the PFP is the one they just took down. Yeah. And the next one is uh, is uh, the initial escape me too. But yes. if they could take the uh, the root cause analysis, the lessons learned from that. And explain how they're 
that's going to be applied to the next project that would be helpful. I saw a letter uh, regarding that, but it was it was uh, not really conclusive. I'd like more detail. Excellent. Yeah, PFP was on my list too, but um, more for the um, once they took it down, they they sampled underneath the slab to do some characterization, and uh, that that data should be ready to be talked about. So maybe a, a PFP omnibus. Um, retrospective. Rose, thank you. Rose. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Tom, I um, we've talked to P and L about that uh, project that they're working on. God, I think it's I think it's been a couple of years. Um, I mean, they've been working on this for quite some time. Um, but I didn't think that it applied to radionuclides. I thought it was other contaminants but not radionuclides. Am I mistaken on that? It it start it, it is expanded. So now it is okay. um they were doing hexchrome, they were doing nitrates, they were doing tech 99, yeah. strontium, um, uranium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there's oh. a lot there. Oh, yeah. okay. It's, yeah, it, it was just my understanding, like I say, it's been a couple of years ago since I've talked to them ab about this. It was, you know, um earlier on, obviously, and, and at that time, I didn't think it applied to any of the radionuclides, but that's great if they're able to expand it, um, then that'll that'll be great. It'll be a great uh, presentation then. Yeah. Okay, some other things that were on my mind that uh, they might jog some conversation. Um, the 200 area inner area, 200 inner area operable unit, which is sort of, um, I don't know if anybody remembers the RASCAL, um, which is the best acronym on Hanford, um, representative analog. Yeah, so basically they took all the sites in the 200 area that, that looked like they had sort of the same characteristics and said, we can sort of do one plan that can address these shallow, you know, um, areas where there's just some asbestos over here. We can just scrape the top off and and, and call it uh, done. Turned all those into one operable unit, and um, it's a way to move progress forward on the central plateau and get some dirty dirt for Erdo um, to balance out the the demolition debris. So um, I think that project might be getting close to the feasibility study uh, RFS phase. So that might be another one of those uh, that we have uh, Jason come in and talk to us on. Uh, trying to look at the central plateau because you know, after after next year, the entire river corridor will have records of decision. So we can really, you know, move into inward. Um, Start looking at the, uh, the goal. Nice job with the acronym, Josh. Yeah, we figured out. <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with science. That's, I think that's a good rascal. That's got to be one of those things where they said, hey, we should be a rascal team. And then they came up with yeah. one. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. Okay, we need an L. Come on. <laughs> okay. Any other ideas? That's basketball. It is. It, it, there's no way we can do all of that. Um, I just, I you know, we're, we're, we're throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks at this point. Yeah. Uh, Do we want to sign prioritization for efforts and interests? I think we'll have to talk with the agencies to see what's right. And we want to make sure that we are getting the presentations that they're ready to give us and that are going to set us up for success in getting timely advice out. And Tom, I appreciate having this conversation and getting that list ahead of time so I can track those things down because that is something that I've been working on this week. So thank you. There's updates on 324. I think it's ripe. I can smell it from here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, 324 will be, I think we got it last. When was our last 324 briefing? Uh, just a few here. months ago. It was yeah. in this room and it was the last one and he said that he'd be ready to come back and talk by the end of the year. So March? Oh, was that? March, yeah. March, February. Yeah. February. Yeah. Yeah, it was this calendar year. Yeah. So that might be something for, for fall. Um, we tend to do the groundwater discussion. Well, now we're sort of morphing into the next phase, um, which is sort of what I was hoping would happen. Uh, so let's, let's move on to committee business. So we're, we've sort of morphed into starting to schedule some, some next stuff. Um, one thing that I would like to propose, um, and I've already talked, I've already proposed it to TPA agencies, and I think they might be okay with it. I um, think we should be good. I'm still just confirming. Yeah. But that's the plan we're moving forward with. So the work plan and calendar that we have this year was designed for online meetings and um, not necessarily for people who have to travel to the Tri Cities to attend in person. Um, so if you look at August, We've got a committee week with two meetings, and then two weeks later we have a full board, and then three weeks later in September there's another committee committee week with two meetings. So um, I proposed to the agencies moving the August committee week, uh, or at least the wrap part of the committee week in August, um, to to that committee week in September. So then we've got the full board in August and then committee week, which would fortuitously be the last committee week for all of the committees that are meeting that week because they're going to be renamed. So we would all be in the Tri-Cities and we could have some kind of, I don't know, extracurricular activity where we could celebrate the successful uh, completion of this committee's mission um, and uh, look forward to the mission of the next one. Um, so I guess save the date for September instead of August, if you can. So Tom, for what we were looking What is that week? Yeah, Lindsay's about to say it. September 12th, 13th, and 14th. So what we would look at is a September 12th, my understanding would be RAP meeting, Wednesday the BCC and PIC would meet, and then Thursday we would have tanks meeting, the 14th. Sorry. And Lindsay. obviously that can be flexible. Can you say those one more time? Sure, please? September 12th would be the RAP meeting. And then currently on September 13th, we have BCC identifying. So then BCC and PIC would have to share a meeting day, which I think I ran that past Sue and Mia, and they were in support of. And then September 14th would be the tanks meeting. And we can always flip BCC, PIC slash tanks, if, yeah. depending on the travelers who are coming in to make it easier for them. So that, that's the tentative uh, flexible schedule. Um, but if there's anything critical, um, yeah, they will, we'll be in communication as soon as that gets finalized. Is that an accurate thing to say? Yes, I need to um, talk to my briefers to make sure that they are able to support that September meeting date. Okay. And for full transparency, I just haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. So okay. on my list for next week. Which, which sort of segues into the next question, which is what are we talking about for topics on, on that meeting, which whether it's in August or September? So for September, what, the only thing I have um, identified here is that infrastructure upgrades. So I think we need to take a look at um, things that the group would like to be briefed on. I, I seem to recall that 324 uh, this topic. Yeah, might be right. OK. Um, and if we're in the 300 area, I'd really like to see whether there's an update on the carbon, uh, the uranium sequestration. Uh, where, uh, for those of you who worked around in 2018-2019, um, in the 300 area, right at the sort of interface between the water table and the Vado zone that fluctuates up and down with the river stage, um, DOE injected uh, hot polyphosphate chemical, uh, chemical into that sort of zone to uh, turn into uh, a mineral to trap uranium in the soil instead of letting it being railway. So three, 300 areas where the uranium was processed and turned into fuel for the reactors. So there's a lot of residual uranium below where they excavated. And so they're trying to shrink that groundwater plume. And that's that was in 2019, I think, the injections were. So 
now would be probably a good time to see whether that worked. So another thing I was thinking about uh, listening to the group today was there seems to be a lot of interest for a tour at Massif. And so, I mean, if I can move mountains, I mean, that would be kind of fun to see if we could bring that to August. I mean, we had a standalone tour for um, the EOC, was it last month? Or, mm -hmm. And I yeah. feel like that was great. Like, I really enjoyed that. Um, I feel like it was well received. Mia, do you have any input on that tour or anything you want to share? I loved it. It was great. Um, they were so, you know, open and welcomed us in and allowed us to ask many questions, especially me. Um, and it was just, I had no idea it existed. And so it was really fun to see some, a place that, um, that's like not what we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, but see how it run. And then also having like the drill there the next week, it was just fun to, to kind of talk all about that. So I thought it was a success. Yeah. I thought it was a great tour, Jan. I bet. Your zombies yeah. didn't help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The zombie apocalypse. Oh, the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Gee, I remember us saying that, but I don't know why. <laughs> because it might be an emergency that they have to activate. Oh, the something EOC. they hadn't thought of yet. <laughs> right. Like a risk they hadn't discovered yet. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, well, underground, obviously, and they definitely had a lot of funding for their equipment over time. I expect that when they started, they didn't have a lot. But computers and giant screens and all of that stuff. But. And it was like for me, I felt like it was kind of a bummer that we only had a handful of folks attend that tour. So um, for the next one, if we could get the I guess the word out as soon as we can and see if we can try to encourage our fellow cab members to attend, that would be awesome. And I think they learned something from that. Um, discharge that they had over there at the Purex plant, you know, when mm -hmm. they were trying to the tunnel collapsing. The tunnel collapsing and then they had to pull pull themselves together and I think they learned lessons that they wound up with new tables with people that, you know, address different issues that they hadn't thought of. So, you know, you live and learn. But I, I think making it during committee week and quote unquote the last committee week um maybe we could add some uh you know we could if we did 324 update on the bus at 324 um and drive past the sequestration and say this is where it was and well, i don't know that we can do a yeah, full on-site tour i mean so. well but if we did 320 if we did just 324 in even that's it's sort of on the way isn't it? We did discover when we did that bus tour that um, it was very, um, you know, there were a lot of stops, there were a lot of things to see, but we really couldn't get off the bus. Right. And what you were supposed to do was have looked at, watched the video, the virtual tour of these various buildings, and then they just drove us by that. So I understand that the technology that's, that we have now that provides for videos has shifted the emphasis from, you know, getting to inside these buildings and having a look at stuff to driving past them. And I don't know if the, you know, it was pandemic, post-pandemic. I don't know whether um, the emphasis is changing over time um but the things that i remember most from tours on the site is when you could get out and look at wesif at the cesium and strontium capsules glowing in the water i mean you could watch it on a video but it made a big difference to be able to see things with your own eyes and uh so anyway when we're talking when you say bus tours then I think, oh, wouldn't that be too bad if we couldn't get off the bus? Understand. And I feel the same way about the cold test facility. Oh. That you really don't, unless you've stood inside the single shell tank at the cold test facility, you really don't mm. get how big they are. The cold test facility is a good one. That's and that's off the Hanford site. That's right. out in your hammer area. But yeah, we went out there for the governorship last year, and then my staff just did a tour of it a couple of weeks ago, and it's just big massive tank and you just get a really good feel for just how huge that thing is. Yeah. 
what a million gallons means. Well, yeah, that, that one, I thought it was just, uh, it's not even a full-size tank. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, yeah, you, you don't, when you say tank, farms, tank, you don't really, it doesn't. And it's underground, you can't yeah. see it. I'm going to take it's, this it's opportunity not, to not talk about tank farms. <laughs> um, so with the goal then, if we can swing it, to be able to get out and tour the mock-up at Massive. So I'm if, gonna, that, if they're housekeeping, yeah, the mock -up should be okay. I'm going to ask the question. I I don't know that the answer will be yes, and I say that because we have a tour scheduled as well in October. Okay. Um, but I'm going to ask. Perfect. Um, but I also have your request. Well, we have the infrastructure update, your request for your rating and sequestration, and the 324 update. So I'll take all of those back and see what we can bring forward for September. Awesome. Um, Rose is in queue or hasn't raised their lowered their hand. Rose, are you in queue? Yeah, um, but I was—I I actually wasn't talking about it. Going to talk about a tour, so I want to make sure where you guys—that's run its course before I start. <laughs> it's all you. Oh, okay. Well, I actually just wanted to go back and make sure that I had um, the dates correct as far as what we're planning on doing, because what I have on my calendar is committee placeholders for August eighth and ninth. And then I have the full board meeting on the 23rd and 24th. So what I'm hearing you say is that we're not going to have the committee meetings on the 8th and 9th. Rather, we're going to bump those to September on the well, 12th, 13th, 14th. Is that Correct. right? Okay. Correct. Okay. That, that the only thing. Yeah, and the only thing that I'm a bit puzzled about is that we were talking earlier. Uh, again, about the timing of our meetings and and um, being able to get our advice so that we could have it at that August meeting, being able to vote on that advice to move it forward to the August HABS, the board meeting. Um, and are we, do we still have that issue? Because if we do, then I don't, it doesn't make sense to, I'm trying to figure out how we're going to be able to do that. That was a problem mm -hmm. earlier. We solved that problem. We we did. We did. We solved the problem uh, by moving the advice to the August board meeting uh, this to today. Okay, so um, we are going to move it as is because I know I was fine with it, but I didn't know if we'd actually gotten the whole vote on that. So I guess I missed that part of it. So we do. So we. So what we were concerned about and not having the vote, we did get the vote. We are moving it to the August board meeting. Yeah, and and okay. we're we're going to make sure that. People at the August board meeting understand if they're not comfortable with, if they don't understand the information or have the level of understanding that they want, um, even after we potentially get a briefing, um, then they do, they can withhold consensus and and move it and bump the advice further. But there's the EIC component. Right. We also and the EIC has to approve the agenda as well. So um, there there's there's a couple steps, but uh, wrap is done with our part. Okay, that's that's what I was just I like I say I must have missed that that was finalized with us. I, I didn't catch that. So okay, then I will take that off my calendar for those days and, and yes. bump that to September. And Rose, as we move forward for the next calendar, uh, EPA, ecology, and DOE got together and took a look at what could be the draft calendar for FY24 and hopefully the layout of it is a little bit better for our out-of-town travelers and so um, that was one of our goals moving forward was to not continue to change meeting dates on people because I know people have a lot of other items on their outside have world to take care of so yeah, this has been, honestly this has been a kind of a rough year for that in particular for me because I I am I belong to way too many groups I think um, but I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a professional meeting goer at this point. But when they do little switches like that, then I'll, I'll, oftentimes I'll end up missing because I've got, you know, a conflict. And so if we could get a more stabilized a calendar, that would be a great help to me, um, as well as, um, you know, I, I do think we need to consider um, the, the, how many times we are meeting it because I'm looking at this wish list of things to talk about and there's a lot on there um and 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 i think they're all important uh, you know i i mean am i'm looking at, at this and i'm thinking what would i get rid of and i 
I, you know, for next year, and I, I just can't see anything. So I'm thinking we really do need to consider whether or not we are actually meeting enough to be able to really um, grab hold of all of these topics to be able to do them justice. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about Hampton is there's never enough meeting time. Yeah, for sure. Nice. And never, yeah, and never, never, and, and, and never a lack of issues to deal with either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And although we appreciate flexibility, we are cognizant that you do have lives outside of the board. So um, we will, I guess, try to stick to our meeting calendar for this next calendar year. And, you know, if we need to add something, we'll take a look at that as it, you know, as it comes along. Yeah, this, this one was just, it was five trips and there are three trips in five weeks. And that was a lot. That's a lot. That's that a is lot. a lot. Um, Appreciate, appreciate everybody uh, being willing to do that. Um, and if, if it really doesn't work for you and you really have a problem with it, please send me an email and we can figure something out. Well, this is, you know, as long as we keep this, the online option like we've been doing, I, at least I'm just going to speak personally for myself. You know, this is a lifesaver for me from, you know, because for me to have to come down there to all of these meetings, I, I would not be able to make all of them. I'm, I have to be very selective when I do travel. And so this online option, this way, the way it's set up and everything works really, really well for me. I feel, I mean, I feel like I'm there with you guys in a sense, you know, so it, this is a, a good option. Excellent. I think hybrid meetings. Yeah. This, you know, this textbook format is like the best thing to come out of COVID. <laughs> it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Provides the opportunity for more people to participate. Mm -hmm. They're here to stay. Okay, so to sum up, we had three agency briefings. We got advice out of the committee. We have potential topics for our next meeting, which uh, will be the last wrap meeting. Uh, so we have to work with the EIC to plan a party. Um, for that week, and and if it's karaoke, that'd be great. If it's not karaoke, that's okay too. Um, so come with bells on, and uh, I guess uh, we can finish 20 minutes early unless someone has something really, really, really pressing. Okay, can you do the honors? Yes, adjourned. Thank you. And tomorrow is the Tank Waste Committee meeting for anybody that's interested and doesn't have it on the calendar. 9 a.m. Here. Thanks, everybody.